Like Gloria, I won't fail my times now. Rise of glory won't back down. I take the pain and I let it out. On the mountaintop, shout it out. Break away, let me demonstrate my mentality. Activate. Oh, Rampage through the side room. Everybody, massive for Bernard, catches everybody else. I'm a warrior. Gonna look to make it happen, and there it is. Proper cannot be stopped. On the mountaintop, shout it out. Break away, let me demonstrate my mentality. Activate. Welcome to Watch Point, one and all. It is the final day of the regular season of the OG 2022. Oh, Crazy to say that out yeah. loud. I am your host, Zoe Schwinn, and with me on the desk once more are Jonathan Marine Force Larson, Scott Costa Kennedy, and Danny Let's Get Weird Lim. I want it to be weird, guys. This last day of the regular season, I want everyone to be weird. You wanted to be called Danzo today, right? What? Danzo? Yeah, call me Danzo. Danzo? Danzo? Because Hanzo is the superior Shimada brother. No, no. Hanzo is overrated. The day Hanzo is the, overrated. The real argument. People don't talk about Hanzo is not a nice guy. He killed yeah. his no brother. No one ever said he's Way a nice better. guy. He doesn't have to be. He's a hotter uh, he's a hotter brother. <laughs> Being hot does not attribute for you to be able to be a bad person. Hanzo buddy. is rude. That's that Mean. makes it even more exciting. Evil. No, he's that doesn't. Guy. Hanzo is evil. Bad mentality. Genji's then. just like a a skinny boy with a big with sword. a cool sword, yeah, yeah it's he cool. cool sword. He just, he's, he's vibing. Like, he's vibing. Yeah, he's just hanging out. Whole identity. He only has a cool sword. And the whole mech suit that he wears, apparently, you just he don't care about. He has to hide that. his insecurities because oh, I'm worried that cyborg. Suit. At least it's not emo. Like yeah. I'm so. Oh no, I killed my All brother. Right, Life's I so gave hard you guys for me. Enough time to discuss the Shimada brothers. Uh, now we go uh, back on track. Although I would like Twitter to chime in on it. Who is? The better Shimada brother. Genji. And why is it one Danzo? Right <laughs> Danzo is not. That's my new favorite. Danzo. The third brother no one talks about. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, now, uh, anyway, last week we did debut our new toy here on Watchpoint. Our amazing artisanal, handcrafted, uh, gluten-free, GMO. Um, <laughs> Good. Anyway, uh, our, yeah. our power right. rankings board. Uh, that's and right. We did a, we did oh. a fantastic uh, job. And I think, I think personally that we did a really good oh, job yeah, in uh, sorting did. it out. This I may look confusing this. to some of you out there. Yeah, uh, this is where we landed on the Western region. And as you can see, it's uh, I mean, scientific, the approach here, definitely. Uh, Casta, you were busy in Dallas last week. So yeah. You didn't get to partake in. I did All see of that. this though. Uh, but how do you feel about is this wrong? Does it look right? Well, let's Where just we... move this while we're here, while we're at the back. <laughs> oh, um, uh, but yeah, no, I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot of things that have, are going on here that need to be looked at. Okay. So, but we also need to bring in the APAC region because that, we're going into true. the playoffs. Exactly, because uh, we did the East uh, and the West separately when we did the power right. rankings. Uh, so. Should uh, all that is left to do is actually add the East now, uh, and uh, let's see where we end all right, up. What we got? This with is the playoffs here. power ranking. Playoffs power ranking. This playoffs, is the playoffs power play ins rank. and playoffs power ranking. Spark. Rank. Depends yeah. on the day, but right now, like, there ish. We'll just leave them there for now as I put them on the board. What? That's, That's what far up. No, they're the Spark. They're good. Well, we'll move Dallas later. Okay, That's Valiant. Do? Uh, we got the <laughs> we got the Soul Dynasty, which are gonna. Pineapple is I'm just off putting here. things well, on the board. Right yeah. 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 Pineapple yeah. look good on Spark. Okay. okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we need to revisit your, your Spark placement here. Oh, yeah. we'll, 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 we'll get there. We're just throwing things at the board. Philly can go mid ish. He's actually throwing and things. And Shanghai at the board. Dragons. The viewers just... are going to come out of these highlights and be like, what? Yeah, <laughs> okay, uh, APAC uh, fans, don't get mad at me just yet. Okay, we're working this out. So let's reorder. Okay. Right. Okay. Spark, I don't think they should be right over there. They're not. And they're, they're so but they can they have a high ceiling down. though they, they do but they're they're, they're but they, so if they play well they need to be like if they play how they did in this most recent yeah. play-ins they'll That's be like a pretty solid team like how many yeah they're like two and 14 yeah. or something like that two and 12 and they, the they should be in the upper quarter yeah. then right now three and 14 no, see they're on the up <laughs> they should move down a little bit more this you guys think uh, okay well let's start okay who do we want at number one yeah let's let's do gladiators Soul Dynasty. Oh, Spark, get out of here. Uh, so Spark, you know, no. You know, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually feeling the Soul Dynasty number one. No. Right. No. Dallas, no. Houston, no. Houston, Houston, uh -uh. Florida. 
So they lost to Spock. Also, they are oh, they really well known to, to No, they did lose this one. They did lose this one. All right, spot. guys, let's move here. All right. Uh, uh, I'm, all right, I want to put Dallas Field number one. Anyone? Uh, I think the Houston yeah, Outlaws no, was. I uh, agree. Houston I agree. Houston Outlaws got a but who Yeah, cares? yeah. Well, sure. they just lost to. Uh, you know, they just lost to a, yeah, who cares? a game. You know, it's things. Uh, gladiators. Sure. Yeah. Gladiators, sure. like. No, 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 I, no, 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 no. Soul, 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 soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soul, yeah, soul, yeah, yeah. second. Yeah, 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 yeah. Soul, second. We happy with that? Lost to Spurs. Well, yeah, but you know, everyone loses a game. Look at Dallas Field. Uh, shock third. Shock, shock third. Shock over gladiators. Shock over gladiators. Shock over gladiators. Shock over gladiators. No, they're no. not. No, 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 no. Shut your no, mouth. No, no, you <laughs> shut it over there. I don't want to hear it anymore. The gladiators. We, I don't want any of this shock simping over here. There we go. Gladiators at number three. Simping, by shock the way. can go a very close. Like we'll okay, put it. I accept that. We'll put them close. That. Yeah. Okay. Make some sure. space here. We gotta move something. Okay. I think Shanghai Dragons needs to come in here. Yeah, I think under shock. Yeah. Under shock. They're the 2021 you, champions. They, they won a stage. The they won the most recent okay. summer showdown stage. Okay. Put some so, respect on Dragons. Okay. Yeah. So, what else we got? Washington. I mean, Li Lippus. Lippus had what, still like an amazing right, where's, season. Where's the Dragons? Dragons. All right, Dragons. Um, you guys are putting Dragons. Yeah. Look, you gotta respect them. They won the summer showdown. You know, they have Lip. He's one of the best hit scan players in the world. You know, double flex support. They can play that with Baby now. Void as well. Void's like, been playing well. Void's been playing well. Like his Junker Queen was insane. Well, I don't think that we were gonna see Junker Queen. Like Void is like arguably a tank road star. He's that good, right? So Shanghai Dragons are also stacked. They have success in playoff scenarios. I think you gotta put him up there with the shock. I think they're being slept on right now, just because they've bit. had a pretty average season. A little bit. They've had an average season. But they have. Some would say the talent is there for the yep. playoffs. Oh my God, um, you have I think, justice I, there. I got nervous for a second. Yeah, no, no. Wait, justice is staying on the table. <laughs> okay, here's. Can we put like Spark if they play well? Like. Uh, 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 all right. Okay, how about? Okay, here's. Let's make a compromise. Okay. I agree. If they play well, they can yeah, be we'll put up there. Yeah, we'll Okay. And as everyone, I do have a spark up my sleeve as well. Okay. So <laughs> if they, oh, yeah, if they don't, play, <laughs> if they don't <laughs> play well, I think they can be that there. Right, so, all right, so, all right, so, all right. So, so all right. Just, we have two sparks. It just depends on which one shows up in the weekend. Okay. Exactly. Um, okay, what else we got here on the on the desk? All right, Houston Outlaws. 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 Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that below Dragons next to Spark. Sure. Like. Houston regular is like to is shark. Uh, hi, uh, yeah, hi, yeah. Shark? Spark? <laughs> yeah, Apples are a shark. Yeah, I love shark. <laughs> Joss? I think, I think they there. should go a little below Spark if they're like. No, in the, in the, in the this perfect. is playoffs like... Houston Outlaws as well. Let's remember yeah. that. They, oh. they don't like Ooh, to do dumb. well in the playoffs. Mm. So, okay, I think we just. I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I think that's fair. Okay, uh, uh, move on. Toronto Defiant, where's the middle of the no, board? Where's those fusion companies? <laughs> we're right. we're going to have to go a little bit there. Fusion's over there, right? Where do they come in? Uh, fusion. Fusion should be above. I think fusion is below the outlaws. Yeah. Right. I, I, are we, are we, are we I happy agree. with Fusion over the Outlaws? I, I, I put some respect on, you know, Sestem and 3. Okay, no. Toronto, I'm sorry, you're too high. You need it. Uh, okay, oh, Atlanta Rain. Atlanta Rain. We forgot about Atlanta Rain. I think oh, man, they gotta be they gotta be up here. Yeah. They gotta be higher than Outlaws, actually. No, in, well, playoffs, in playoffs, I'd move Spark down and put up Nathan Rain above them. Like, yeah, like I agree we, with we that. We wanna go yeah. like here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. good. Oh, that's I like. Alright, okay, okay, we're we're happy with that. All yeah. right. Uh, so what do we got? What else we got? Uh, Guangzhou Charge, Chengdu Hunters. I'm sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> See you next year. Uh, yeah, see you next year. Uh, yeah, yeah. Should we should we take these out too? Then? Yeah, yeah. We yeah. got these guys. Oh, London Spitfire. Yeah, London Spitfire. They're in it. They're in it. I, yeah, I'm gonna go to like. I Back think Spitfire deserve okay. to be there. Okay. Yeah. Ye mm. Sorry, guys. Bye -bye. You had a great season. Um, Do you, okay. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Do you not think London Spitfire deserves to be above Fusion? No. 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 Another Is team, no. another team that has not performed well in the playoffs. Well, I think Philadelphia Fusion. They are looking to oh, be playing quite well. Oh, it's playoffs, alright. Yeah, we're playoffs. All right, all right. That's my thing. Uh, I don't know. I think Spitfire should be above Fusion if I don't know what's happening to Zest. Remember he had that, that, the, is true. that hand injury? So if Zest is not playing, then well, what about I think Carpe? Carpe is one of the best of all He time. has been playing well though. He played one match well. And it was, I was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't take much really. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm an easy man to play. I just, I just, uh, so you know, we, I know that a lot of Spitfire. Are we like, assuming that Zest is going to come back for this? Sure. It should be. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Who knows? Got enough time. Yeah. They don't know. Yeah, they don't know. Right. We're not medical doctors. Hey, We're analysts. How do we feel We're about one of the Spitfire playing Rush right now? I'm not so. I'm not in love with it. I love it. I think it's I'm gonna work. I, okay. I love it, but I think it's very one-dimensional. And no, no, I do think I, it is. Okay, it is one-dimensional, but it, it, it is very effective. And I and Violet. Sold yeah, but it's not gonna come as a surprise. People will know. They'll know, but that doesn't mean that they could. They didn't stop the Atlanta Rain last year. Yeah, that's true. 
They I kept think they're going to point. upset one of those teams. So Northwest mm. are going to upset one of yeah. those three teams of them. Yeah. Okay. How, how about a compromise? What if we put London here? Okay. All right. Is All right. It, can, I, can I convince everyone yeah. that? Yeah. Christopher yeah, well, and Backbone are going to mold, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's fine. Okay. So now we got the the four remaining play-in teams on the uh, West. I hate those. In our head. Yeah. <laughs> this, this that is, right in the middle. Okay, right, right in the middle. middle. Right in the middle. Just how it's going to go this upcoming weekend. <laughs> and so the press to go? <laughs> oh, I guess the fines. No, <laughs> okay, okay, can we make it like a circle? And it, it'll be oh, the circle yeah. of... A circle of we're players? Gonna make, can circle we make of players. <laughs> the circle of the Western Region You're players. You're genius. All right, yeah. uh, wait, Boston can't be on top. We need to make it a diamond. <laughs> yeah, 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 we need to make it a diamond. <laughs> it, it, it just doesn't make sense like that. <laughs> that's a square, guys. I'm just... <laughs> I'm oh, not that's a, a different square. Yeah. I'm not great at geometry, but that's a square. It's a diamond. That's it's kind of a diamond. Yo, I love this. I love that's this. an angled square. Uh, I think I think this is a good uh, a good power ranking. And I, you know what I really dig about it? Yeah. This might look messy to you, like, but that doesn't make sense. They're not above and beyond. Yeah, but that's exactly how the season went. That's it. True. The mid has been so close to each other just because I'm loving this, right? the skill. <laughs> The skill of all of these teams, like you, you can argue, you can make an argument for each and every one of them right. to be on the top on a good day, and, and, and that's fantastic. And we don't even know what the playoffs meta is exactly. really going right. to be yet. We haven't seen what the patch is going to be. These teams have all had, like we have fuel at number one. They lost to the Houston Outlaws just recently. The Spark just recently beat the Seoul Dynasty, right? Like it's it's a toss up for yeah, all we really, know. We know nothing. But so whatever we just did was an epic waste of everyone's time. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it anyway. And now, uh, yeah, but there's definitely some uh, teams which we need to look out for, such as the San Francisco Shock, because I mean, they are a two time champion, right? And perhaps yep. uh, uh, a lot of people would pick them as the champion again, just for convenience sake. And we actually uh, will have a word with uh, Krusty Woo! in just a little bit. That's right. Arguably one of the greatest coaches <laughs> in the OHD. Yeah, yeah, Krusty. Boy, yeah, and because we're going to have Krusty on the show uh, to talk shop with us about San Francisco, uh, about their season and the upcoming playoffs right after this break. So stay tuned.
Welcome back to Watchpoint. As we near the end of the Overwatch 2022 regular season, we wanted to take the time to talk to perhaps the most consistent force in the league, not just this year, but every season since the inception of the Overwatch League. We're happy to be joined by San Francisco Shock coach, Krusty. Hello. Hey, how are you guys? <laughs> Hey, hi, hey, hey. Hey. Oh my God. Hello, hello, hi. Yeah. Uh, Krusty, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, I've been impressed by your English, so, you know, we'll start there. But if at any time, if you, you know, you want to switch to Korean, I got you, brother. So you just, you do you, and then I'm here to support you, all right? For sure, appreciate Danny. All right, so, okay, uh, I'd like to start by asking, what would you say the Shock's biggest achievement has been so far this year? Well, to be honest, there's a lot of things we made this year, but definitely made the second place with the Lucas. I think that that is most important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. I, uh, you gotta talk about the shock. You know, you've been so consistent. I mean, would you look at mm -hmm. your resume right now and you can see 2020 Grand Finals, you know, uh, so many stages you've been so good at, but you've had so many good players on your roster, but you also made a lot of changes to your roster. So I, I'm, I'm wondering, how do you scout players? Like, what do you really value when you scout players? How are you able to find such amazing players year after year? Well, like every year, I try to like making a superstar, actually. And like, I try to make a team based on him. You know, I always like get some superstars players. Like, so this year also, like, I, I mean, we definitely sign a proper and then we, we try to looking for like, who can help the proper the most. And, uh, you know, we try to make the team based on him. Interesting. I actually want to follow that thread uh, for a second, Krusty, mm -hmm. because, you know, some people have said that Proper gets a lot of the resources from the San Francisco Shock mm -hmm. and that enables him to be as good as he is. Is there truth to that? Do you intentionally try and give him a lot of resources to make him as successful as he is? I mean, I feel like uh, every team is a leader and I feel like a Proper is doing a great at his job and, uh, I mean, he deserved to get the poke for sure. But also yeah. the thing is, proper, <laughs> yeah. But also the thing is, like a proper, he also sacrificed, you know, based on like enemy team style and our team style. So like, I mean, some of the points are right, but some of the points are not, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I guess. Yeah. Right on. Now, uh, shock. I mean, no one can argue that they once again had a very strong regular season, uh, but they did lose uh, tournaments to both Dallas as well as the uh, LA Gladiators. Would you consider one of those two teams to be like the biggest rival or is there another teams you guys really watch out for? <clears throat> well, we get like two time vice champion this year. What? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so like, <clears throat> I mean, I actually want to meet the Gladian Dallasos for, you know, for the lead brands. Like, you know, like Shock always like meet the enemy at the starting and we lose and uh, we want to lead banjo the next time. Well, this is the time to lead banjo, so I want to meet both, to be honest. Dallas and Gladi. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Why not both? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love yeah. that. Uh, yeah, you, the higher seed you get, the more choice you get as well when you, you, you pick your opponents, of course. So going into this weekend, you had the opportunity to secure uh, number two seed or number three seed, number four seed. You got the number two seed. How important is uh, a higher seed to the San Francisco show? Well, you know, like for the map priority and also I think Legger season leader is like really important for the coaches. Like because you need to win every meta. You need to win every meta to get the good leader, right? So you need to be like flexible and also the, like the players are. And I mean, so the second seed was like really important for me as from you know, being a uh, coach, coaching, and like, uh, second thing is, there's like, a, you know, always a first seed curse. So I like the R seed right now. <laughs> first smart, seed, first smart. seed curse. Smart, smart. <laughs> yeah. All right, Krusty, let's be honest. Uh, I mean, yeah. we know that, you know, we know that the San Francisco Shock is going to go into the grand finals and win it all. And you know that you guys are going to go into the grand finals and win it all as well. Oh. But who is your prediction of, you know, who will you play <laughs> against? Like, who do you think is going to be the team that's going up, going to be up against San Francisco Shock in the grand finals? Well, I mean, always we think like a high chance we can make Gladi, Shanghai or Seoul, but I really want to meet the Shanghai Dragons for a rivalry, you know? They pick mm -hmm. us and like, they made us lose and get the four seed. So 
well, this time I want to meet them at the <laughs> final. You know. All right. I respect a grudge match. San Francisco, yeah. Shock. Like San Francisco Shock versus the Dragons. That's gonna be. That's gonna be yeah, good. All right, Krusty. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, yeah, good luck in the playoffs. And we'll see you in Anaheim. Thank you, Krusty. Thanks, Krusty. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. See you later. <laughs> Wow, what a force of nature. Back-to-back -back champions in 2019 and 2020. Uh, and they do it with a different roster every year. <laughs> I guess it's actually crazy if you think about it. It's the definition of they can't keep getting away with it, but yeah. like in a good way. Like, Krusty, you know, he hasn't won a Coach of the Year award, but he has been so impressive yeah. since, you know, his inception into the league. He's just created roster after roster that, as Johnny said, has just been a dominant force. It was interesting to hear him talk about an individual stylistic player yeah. that they like to build around. We haven't really heard that from many coaches, yeah. but it makes sense with the way that they're playing the game, the way Proper seems to you know, be that player for them. They've enabled, enabled him to do that. Will that work going to the playoffs? Because it's worked to get the number two seed, but they have yet to get that tournament win off of that style. Yeah, I also think it's important to keep in mind, like Jotes, for example, I think a lot of people are going to look at the finals, you know, San Francisco Shock against the Dallas Fuel and be like, well, this was the end of the line for like trying to enable proper. But that was a different meta. Like we're we're evolving. You, we don't know what the playoff meta is going to be and like what is going to be the most optimal style. Maybe we go into a tank meta and you know, Kalush could be great. Maybe we go into a support meta and like a you know Finn Violet could be an amazing backline. So we don't know what we're getting yet, but they're keeping their eyes, you know, peeled for anything. Maybe it'll be like pocket proper, maybe Kilo will be involved, stuff like that. So the San Francisco Shock in general just have like a really well-rounded roster and having proper to enable them in some metas is a great option for them. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. I personally am a big fan of proper. So <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, 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 that's crazy. That's, uh, that comes out of nowhere. Uh, now we do look forward, of course, to seeing the San Francisco Shock in the playoffs, but we do have to finish at the regular season first. So we have two matches remaining on this fine Sunday. Boston will play against Paris and Houston will face off against Toronto. And we'll get into those games and tell you what you should be watching out for for both of those matches right after the short break. We look
Welcome back to Watchpoint. Two matches remain in the regular season, and while the playoffs uh, or play-ins are set, there's still some knowledge. We can, that's right, too. We can all count it, too. I'm so proud of this desk. It took the entire season, but we got there in the end. First it was just one, now it's two. Maybe next season we're gonna count Sounds to three. Like no. Either way, two matches uh, we will see today and there might still be some knowledge we can gain from both of those matches and about the teams. Yeah. Right, uh, as we finish up the regular season. At Boston, uh, they do play Paris and uh, I think we, we saw a lot, or heard a lot rather, from Paris uh, assistant coach Faustus yesterday. He shared some great insight with you on the desk. Uh, but uh, if we're looking at their opponents today, Boston, what you looking out for, Danny? Uh, for me, for Boston, you know, of course, they had a good win yesterday. And I talked to Seeker. Seeker seems to be the Sojourn player for Boston. And I liked his attitude. <laughs> uh, <but I'm> gonna, <laughs> Same. You know, fuel, fuel my energy. anger, we you know? That. So I'm trying to <laughs> channel in my anger right now for not for Paris, I mean, but I, I want to talk about Victoria because we saw something interesting yesterday where Victoria is usually their head scan player, but now that they're playing Seeker, he's playing a different role where we used to see Valentine on that Genji. Yesterday, we saw Victoria play that Genji for the team. And I think I honestly think it was pretty good. I don't want to say it was like phenomenal, but it was, <laughs> I it was there. We made, I love that we turned that into a stat card. You could have just <laughs> said like, he never played Genji before, but now he played him, but now I was like, so, but look at those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Zero. So honestly, like, I'm just for my curiosity. I just want to see Victoria on that Genji again. Like, can yeah. he actually help Seeker, help the team to get that win again once more against uh, Paris Eternal? And I, so I definitely have my eyes set on Victoria's Genji. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm curious to see, like, or know about Victoria's flexibility because we haven't seen it that much in the league so right. far throughout this year. And you know, if you asked me, can Victoria play Genji? I would have been like. Sure, I guess, and you know now here yeah. it is. So I, I, I want to get more tests to see if it is going to be able to hang with the better teams. Uh, and I think against the Paris Eternal, I would love to see him take over the game a little bit more than he did in the last match. Why are you smirking? Why are you smirking? Why are you smirking? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think Genji's one of those heroes in Overwatch that like everyone thinks they can play Genji. <laughs> <laughs> it's like if a coach was like, "Hey, can you play Genji for us?" I'm like, absolutely. My Genji is. Pristine. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> yeah, I am great at Genji. All my ranked matter. experience Main trained support. me for this. Day. Flex support, <laughs> main tank. I can't I can't play Genji. I'm gonna be honest about it. World Super first, I'm, first I'm to like, admit ever. I'm garbage at it. Not just bad, I'm like below. Yeah, no. I'm, I'm alright. Yeah, I'm a, no, I'm 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 excellent. No, you're, you're not alright. I saw your Genji. <laughs> like that is a lie, straight up. Uh don't tell the people. Alright, I'll take it back. Now uh we do have one more match to discuss, actually, and that's going to be officially the last match of the OH League 2022 regular season. And so that sad. one, I know, right? That one will be fought up between the Toronto Defined and the Houston Outlaws. And oddly enough, oh. um, this turned into a bit of a rivalry. I mean, not really, but we got, we got to turn it into a rivalry. Right, right, right now. Let's turn it into a rivalry. Right. Whoa, a, look at this. They have a 2-2 record this season. Whoa. They met three times in the playoffs. Whoa! What? I'm pretty sure I heard Dante say on stream that he saw Hisu spit in his cereal. <gasps> uh, it, no it, way! It was crazy. No. It was what? Crazy. Yeah, yeah in, in Toronto, it happened. I, I swear mm -hmm. to you. That, and it, since then, it's been a grudge match for the ages. That is crazy. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. I, I, I heard uh, Moby Dick once cut off Jake in traffic. Oh my god. Yeah. In LA traffic? Yeah. That, that, that would cool. be the worst thing in the world. Uh, Actually, it happens all yeah. the time. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot on stake. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's stake, of brother. Going yeah, back and yeah. Forth. yeah I, I, that's very meaningful. Apparently, yeah. Pelican's pet Pelican. Pelican took on Hisu's pet goose. Pelican. Oh god! No, I heard, I heard Pelican. <laughs> was, they got the in a fight. They separated too. Hoppa is a food. Hoppa is a food. Yeah. Hoppa is a food. It's an actual like a fish cake on yeah. a stick. Yeah, a Pelican doesn't like Hoppa. Oh my yeah. god! The, the food Hoppa. So Hoppa is. Personally, so, like, personal, so, so, so Hoppo was attacked by the fact that he yeah, understandably oh, wow. so. <laughs> that that um, sounds quick. Well, yeah. Wait, so as you can tell, there's clearly a rivalry yeah. going on yeah. there. Uh, Custom, Look at these guys. That's a reinforce. Uh, <laughs> But which team, aside from all those rumors which we definitely did not just make up, no, um, no, no but way. which team is this match more important, would you say? Well, for the Houston Outlaws, you have to expect they're guaranteed a spot going to the playoffs heading into this weekend. I I wouldn't be surprised if they were just practicing the upcoming patch or like playing some Kiriko, trying to see if they work. So for the but Houston Outlaws, it definitely isn't that important. Maybe that's why they took a loss in the previous one. But for the Troy and Defiant, they're going to the play-ins. This is an important meta and probably an important match. Yeah, I mean, this is what they're going to play in the play-ins, right? And they have to excel at this. So if you're able to take down the Houston Outlaws, great. But if Toronto shows up and goes like 0-3, I'm like, 
<laughs> go Boston, I guess. Like, I don't know. Like, Toronto, you got to prove it this time around. You know, this is important stuff. It is. It is. And there's only one way to find out how those matches will go. And that's, of course, by looking at our predictions because we're right yeah. so often. Yeah. So let's take a look at where we're going from these matches. I don't think we're going to agree on all of those. Yeah. Yeah. No. Any post? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, this wow. one, though. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Go on, Scott. I, I, Go I, on. I, I can't, Think about. I I can't nice. really defend it too much. Uh, <laughs> the, the Houston Outlaws, they just didn't look good in their first. I genuinely don't think they are as focused on this match yeah. as Toronto Defiant is going to be, and I think Toronto Defiant has everything to prove. Oh, so. yeah. Toronto, they look sick. They, they look They yeah. look great. Well, I mean, I love the aesthetic of Were you of those forced tickets, into so making this friend? No. I, he tossed no, the coin. I no, I felt bad for it. Dante, and I felt bad after, you know, Hisu's goose lost to Pelican's Pelican. Yeah, it's been rough out there. Uh, either way, uh, I am excited to finish out our season strong. Let's hope for some great matches and to bring you all the action are, of course, uh, Uber and Mr. X. They're ready to go. Hey, guys. Are they? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Push us out here yeah. in front of this game. They go, all right, Mitch and Matt, how about this one? How you guys feel? Paris, the turtles on yeah. schedule. It's Weird yes. there. <laughs> I am ready to go. <laughs> Ever since August I, mean, I just love how Scott was just like, we're going to bother to defend her. All right, look here. There are, there are so many problems with, like, the, the, the pick of the Toronto Defiant in that second game, though. <laughs> like, Scott knows full well that the, <laughs> the prophecy dictates that Toronto must be so bone-hurtingly mid that they have to be 12-12. <laughs> and 12. And you've upset the... The TBA exactly. is coming for you, my guy. Because yeah. you've upset the continuum now, <laughs> like, even suggesting that they might go 13-11. Yeah, but you know, sometimes you got to go against uh, the grain. You know, sometimes Troy, this is I the season no Troy Define say that they're not mid. Mm. For, uh, do you ever math? <laughs> <laughs> they are though. They just, they just are. It's an incontrovertible fact of life. Like it's written in the stars. It's like E, that number that keeps recurring in nature, that governs the growth of everything. <laughs> yeah, they, have to, they have to win to get there, Mitch. Though they're eleven and twelve. Oh. They have to win, so Scott's right. Your entire argument. Yeah, see? Oh, yeah, okay, see, look, tell what, uh, we're like delayed by like three minutes. It's like brutal. Get us out of here. Bye, guys. <laughs> Enjoy this one. All right, yeah, we're going to we're gonna cut to the game here as we're going to crash into each other permanently. Thank you very much, Disc. All right, look, uh, uh, Matt, for, for yeah. the love of God, let's talk about this first game uh, because obviously a, a very different look for the Boston Uprising. It's like a change of tack here. Where Seeker's being brought in much more of the time, and there's a, a change of role assignment here that secondary DPS. Boston showing us they've got a few more tricks up their sleeve here, and it's sort of just as well because a lot of those play ins, uh, matchups are locked in. They have to play against Florida first. It, which is a really tough matchup with uh, how we've seen Florida obviously play the other day. Uh, I think like all of those play in teams are so equal right now. Uh, like it's going to be. It's really going to be like matchup dependent, I think, on like who actually makes it out. Uh, where, you know, maybe that first matchup, uh, you know, for Boston is going to be tough because like Hydron's playing at a, a sick level, right? Like Seeker is going to need to play the Sojourn at that high of a level to keep Boston in it. Yeah, and in the meantime, of course, the Paris Eternal stand in the Boston Uprising's way. Uh, look, a team that have had to retool multiple times uh, throughout this season, but on the Boston side, Crimzo uh, has been back in the lineup now, of course, as we're seeing a little bit more of that double flex support or a little bit more of that Ana. If it's Ana or Baptiste, Crimzo is your guy. He's actually number one in sort of fewest deaths and number one in enemies slept so far uh, in the Countdown Cup. So big part of uh, their prowess is his mechanical skill continues to drive them forward. It's also interesting because Boston had a rough stretch throughout the season, right, where uh, you know, Crimzo, Punk, like, Seeker obviously wasn't of age yet, but, like, weren't seeing playing time, but they seem to be, like, the players that fit in the best, right? And, like, you end up losing a ton of games. Like, you know, not saying you play Punk and Crimzo and all of those turn to Ws, right? But y y you don't know. Like, they could have actually found themselves way closer to guaranteeing a spot than many people would have expected. Uh, because Punk and Crimzo have been that good in the support and the tank role. Yeah, so they have a good idea of what lies ahead of them, right? There's... Uh, 
you know, with the Florida Mayhem standing in their way, and they still have to beat the winner of the Defiant and the Justice to make playoffs. So it's not out of the question, but now they really need to get their motor turning over, and they really need to start to show that they're more than just, you know, a team that gets to slip into the play-ins here in 10th, mind you. So they are, uh, you know, the lowest-ranked Western team to make play-ins. A lot on the line for the Boston Uprising over the, over the coming weeks here, and they want to start on the front foot. A lot of good things to hang their hat on in this roster we talked about, but we're still unsure about what this Seeker and Victoria Tour de Force is supposed to look like. It looks like there are some discussions. I think Victoria and Punk are actually talking to each other based on where they're at. So uh, I know that they're looking in different directions, but that's the way it is. <laughs> Let's have a look at the Paris Eternal here, Matthew, with a single win to their name over the course of this season. It's been tough, but this newest iteration of the Paris Eternal roster has had some good signs. Luke Mino as well. Um, has impressed me multiple points on that Baptiste. And I think we've seen some positive things from these players. I don't think they came into the easiest situation uh, at all throughout the season. Uh, so, so I'm hoping we, we obviously see a good performance from them today, but more in the future of like how they develop, whether as a team or individually, because I think there's some talent. Maltel also <laughs> I'm trying to get inside of his camera. <laughs> all right, fair enough. Oh, I mean, that is... That's, that is, uh, that is, I think, I don't know if he's trying to look at his eye. or he's just, yeah, check these eyes. These are sharp. Uh, I'm ready to spot these, uh, these opportunities across the map to dive in on the tracer and find eliminations. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Uh, he's looking for, uh, look, this team, uh, again, something maybe not a huge deal in the grand scheme of things, but this is probably the last time we <laughs> actually see the Paris Eternal as the Paris Eternal take to the field in the Overwatch League, right? With the changes coming with this organization next year. Uh, essentially their last outing as we know them. So we're definitely hoping to see the fruits of a really long year. Oh, yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, they're they're, they're going to be in uh, Vegas here in 23. So really uh, la last kind of go around here for uh, Paris. Is, uh, got the tweet up on your screen now. So uh, Vegas, Vegas getting everything. I mean, they got, uh, you know, Football now, hockey, you know, they should have basketball, but they don't. That's another conversation to have. But uh, they'll have the Eternal. Uh, so then maybe uh, maybe you kind of get, get to a new place, Mitch, right? Everything starts over again. Things start going in the right direction. Yeah, an opportunity as well to think about what formula uh, is going to be the best to carry them through that 2023 season. But for now, we need to see, I guess, the culmination of their efforts here in 2022. Boston Uprising, 9-14. and 14, uh, A season where they themselves have had no shortage of, uh, you know, mix-ups and changes. Especially, you know, when it came to deciding who was going to be the player at Tank to kind of lead this team forward, right? Boston, you know, definitely made some investments at, you know, trying to create a very strong role at Tank. But they end up falling back on uh, one of the most consistent components well, of this roster, right? The Punk is the one, the player to lead them forward. It's kind of crazy. Almost like they went out of their way the entire season to like try not to play Punk, even when he was like like playing really well. Uh, you know, they trade for Mag, right? Uh, you know, they've uh, it's on the roster. They've you know just kind of rotated around the circus of tanks, but Punk has always played consistently. Uh, so now you have him in here at the end. You've seen your best results. Uh, we're gonna potentially lead into a victory today. So, Victoria. Hovering over the 76 here. So 76 uh, with the Sojourn in the mix here for the Boston Uprising. That's a lot of damage uh, where Paris Eternal, they have to be careful. Nobody can get caught out here because, you know, including the Batiste in the way, right? Uh, Going to be very difficult to live for long in the open. Kind of expecting to see Victoria try and play off angles here or, or wrap around a little bit. The Eternal, though, really just want to go en masse into the entire lineup of the Boston Uprising here. Maybe deny Victoria the time he needs to to get a lot of damage done over the course of the fight. Paris want to take this engagement, but Punk is able to hold strong in the front line, and he just laser removes Luke Mino from the Paris Eternal lineup here. So the Eternal, they're the ones to go forward, but looking a bit scrappy. Yes, uh, they're not able to find anything as uh, Boston will take the point first. So, I mean, look, if you try and get aggressive, right, especially even with that Tracer, Punk's got both bubbles to use. He'll get charged up. She's going to be able to burn players down with the amount of damage they're able to put out. So we'll see Paris uh, just kind of waiting here a second, maybe trying to get that speed back. We're going to amp up, make a play. But you see Boston, they rotate out. They don't even want to take the fight up here. 
Yeah, again, setting up in such a way to slow the Eternal down, give Victoria a nice little vantage point. It's going to be crucial for them here. And again, they, they do kind of counter-rotate with the Paris Eternal. The Boston Uprising control the point. They're not really incentivized to, to take a 5v5 that they're at risk of losing here. They don't want to group up either as that Pulse Bomb becomes more deadly, but Dove's able to remove Seeker there. Now he's starting to find some key connection with those railguns, and Crimso has to throw down an immortality fill, but needs to contest with Paris's drone. And it's going to be Malpil finding a connection with that Pulse Bomb here. Paris able to get back in and start controlling this point. Yeah, as uh, just really the Pulse Bomb and the M Matrix need to use there for the Paris Eternal. So uh, being able to flip the point, not letting Boston get up to that 50% mark. This next fight, though, I think is going to be massive for both teams, right? You're going to have, uh, what, the Grav Online, Sound Barriers, you know, Tac Visor here for the Boston Uprising. You're going to see a lot of Ultimates dumped into this one from both teams. Yeah, I'm curious to see how this Tac Visor plays out. Okay, Victoria pretty preemptive here, but he knows he's playing the off angle now based on how Boston approached the point, but that's a perfect railgun to shut that ultimate down. Dove completely yeah. pacifies Victoria, and that's going to be a sound barrier for Rack Attack to give the Eternal the gumption to go forward. And Boston with that tech fires her, like it's on that off angle, maybe just trying to you know, force everybody from Paris behind cover, and then you can like bully them out, but it does not work at all as Dove hits some really nice railgun shots. That kind of turns the tide there in that fight where, yeah, you know, if Victoria is able to use that uh, attack visor from the kind of like top choke there, shoot down towards the point. If, if Paris is forced behind those pillars, Boston, you can kind of like speed boost into them, right? And, you know, they kind of have to hold that position or they move back into the line of sight of the 76. That shot from Dove is huge, though. Eliminates that entire play from happening. So it's really weak against snipers, and that's kind of what Sojourn becomes during that ultimate, especially. Krawi pushes up here, Air Matrix in play. Combines very nicely with the Graviton Surge, if I do say so. And it'll be a pretty resounding eternal fight win now as they're going to go to 85%. Oh, yeah, yeah it's uh, new for Boston. You're just going to have this Ant Matrix, but not exactly the type of ultimate you want with the point ticking up towards 100%. You're going to have to stay right around that area to be able to get great value out of it. So, see Crimson kind of maybe working along the outside. It's going to be Punk who's going to have to get on the touch. Oh, Dove, another one. This time it's Victoria on the Genji to get shut down. Stunning headshot with that railgun. This puts the uprising well and truly behind the eight ball to start with. And now Dove's looking for an off angle of his own. An air matrix there from the Boston uprising, but unclear really how much they've really gotten from that. As the Eternal can just hide behind this architecture on the point. And now Dove wants to go forward here. No chance for the uprising to touch the point. Dove really taking the round over. Oh, yeah. We've seen some good performances from Dove in the past. Uh, really good performance here from Sojourn, uh, Dove on the Sojourn at the start. And that's kind of like rare, you, to, you look forward to the Boston Uprising against the Florida Mayhem. And, you know, obviously Dove, very good player. You would probably put Hydron in another tier, though. And if you're going to have trouble, like, kind of really corralling Dove on the Sojourn, like, I imagine in that play-in, it's going to be really tough. Yeah, uh, it's a great point. If we're starting to look forward and, and sort of both at this game and also at the next one for the Uprising, it's a little bit of a worrying sign. As a team who's only been able to scrape that one win this season is putting so much pressure on you. Boston definitely need to shore these things up and use this game as an important uh, test run for what their approach is going to be further down the track. Let's see how I this mean, plays out now. So so oddly enough, is, is like this a really terrible matchup? for the Boston Uprising in the sense that like, if you win, you win against a team that's one in 22, do you really gain like a ton of momentum off of this win, right? But like, if you were to lose this game, for instance, like it is such a booming probably going into play-ins uh, that, that it would seem like a massive L, a huge negative. It'd be like the only thing people talk about going into the week about the team. Uh, where oddly enough, like a decent amount of pressure just because you don't want to lose the Eternal. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, okay, I don't think it's going to do com wonders for your confidence, that's for sure. Especially oh, no, against no, no, a, a Mayhem team that are trending in the opposite direction based on what we saw from their outing against the Outlaws. So, Boston, though, look, limited bandwidth for consideration of this stuff, Matthew. You probably need to focus on the here and now. Off to a good start of this round, but Mountful finds a way in. He's actually switched over to the Genji from the Tracer that he's been on for much of this map. Man, Paris, that's a, as close to like a neutral fight as you're going to get with like Zarya-based compositions. They just kind of win out some of these individual yeah. stashes. 
Yeah, they just kind of walk them down, right? Uh, push them back, push them back. Moth was able to just... I mean, you saw when he crossed that whole, whole gap in the middle of the map. Like, wasn't really taking any fire, no pressure on him. Was able to get in, get a dash and a kill as he moves away from the trade server to the Genji. Is Crimson Co. trying to, like, work their way here towards Sepa? You've already lost your tank. You're going to have to back up now. Yeah, Immortality Field as well is just not going to hold up there. That's such a long corridor for Crimson to have to risk turning his back and walking straight back up. And yeah, Paris are going to punish Boston. Seems like an interesting way to try and take a fight, or a place, rather, to take the fight. Because you probably hard to get good uh, amplification matrix value for Crimzo. Let's see where the Uprising try and go now. Probably straight back to main, I want to uh, suggest, but the high ground is being contested. And you're going to have a sound barrier for both of these blades that are going to come out, so... Victoria oh, he did. using his, he hits really low. I feel like he knew what was going to be used in response there. Both teams used their sound barriers at the threat of the Dragon Blades. So now let's move on to the next uh, cadre of ultimates. It's going to be a Dove Overclock here with Luke Mino's Immortality Field having gone down. Krow is going to now use the Graviton Surge and Seeker looks to get value from his own air matrix. And Amp disrupt the shot seems to have done the trick as Boston can rotate down to the point. Yeah, as Luke Mino uses his air matrix in the fight previously, so Crimzo having that there, being able to shoot it directly towards like that grab, you know, get a line of sight of that. Also, like, once the M-Matrix went down, if you kind of were paying attention to the time, like, Malta went in trying to make a play for the supports, took a ton of damage. I mean, he went down, like, 5 HP. Uh, basically, he was out of the fight for most of the time, just trying to, like, get some healing or health packs. So, big win there for the Boston Uprising, but 75% already for the Eternal. It's like, you just need, like, one fight to go your way, and I feel like you're in a really good spot to steal map number one. Oh, Victoria! Matt, again, at the start of the fight, takes a ton of damage! Dive able to pressure him down with just a charged rail body shot, if I'm not mistaken. He wasn't deflecting at the time, and Paris can quickly flip this back unless Seeker can shut this down. Wasn't looking very likely anyway. Rack attack will mark the place of his fallen opponent here as we have a flip back for the Eternal. These two teams, dare I say it, very evenly matched. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking is like really back and forth between these teams. I think if you're the Boston Uprising, uh, you're really like. You know, Seeker's got to come alive here, and also, like, Victoria, like, dying early in some of these fights, taking, like, loads of damage at the front, slowing the team down. So at this point, you're just trying to, like, what, maybe farm a Blade, farm an Ant Matrix, and you're looking at last fight, Terrace, where he lost Crimzo! And he had the Ant Matrix, Matt! He was the one that we're going to rely on there, just for the extra push to get him over the line. But instead, the Boston Uprising just fall to pieces. They shatter! And there's no putting him back together now. The Paris Eternal take the first map in this series as Boston... Shaky is a nice way of putting their outing so far. Shaky is a very nice way. I thought you saw Paris look really good in round number one. I thought that was really like Dove coming alive on the Sojourn. But, you know, this second point, a, a full-on team effort there from the Paris Eternal. You know, recognizing what the Boston Uprising were trying to do at the end there. Build for that Amp Matrix, collapse onto Crimzo, prevent him from even getting it off. All right, Paris, good looks for them so far. Dove definitely been on fire. He has a great map. Everyone combining for a good result for the Eternal. Let's see if they can extend this lead or if Boston have a little bit more at this lead.
Are they going to collect this back? <laughs> it's wobbling it with a double pulse. Yeah, look at that dark hit in the old skewed happy. But it's just done away, hit it. Where is the girl fighting? All right, pretty clean, pretty clean stuff from Dove uh, on Busan across the entirety of the map, Matthew. Sojourn looks excellent. I mean, from things like this, shutting down attack visor just as Victoria tries to open up. Uh, you know what I mean? He's taking risks trying to deal with such long-range hit scan uh, and playing an off angle, but Dove did a heck of a lot with what he was given. Very solid showing here. Neither team really, uh, there weren't that many fights. There's actually a lot of back and forth, a lot of posturing. Uh, in this particular yeah. matchup. And then people just sort of kind of getting soloed out there is the sort of the two masses of five trying the, to sort of The entire space. map was like one long uh, game of Coliseo at the start where everybody <laughs> just postures for a posi yeah. position. San Francisco so. versus uh, versus Washington-esque yeah. Coliseo. Um, As a, I, I will I, say, I, I think, the Genjis, the yeah. Genjis get hammered there, right? Like, I mean, they both do. Victoria and Malthul are just like five HP at the start of each of these fights. Yeah, and I think that's probably just the nature of like playing the Genji into like the bath and things like that, right? And trying to go in and you know make plays, especially if your Zarya doesn't have bubbles for you. Uh, I I think as we go into King's Row, which is map number two, I think you're you know maybe like Punk pulls out some like Sigma type stuff, but Zarya Diva, you know, just seem to be so strong in terms of the tanks right now that like in Sojourn just seems to be so dominant whether it's you know overwatch league whether it's the live game right like where if you're sojourn if you're the paris eternal like dove is like playing how he played in map number one you have a excellent chance to win this series especially because i mean dove's gonna have the opportunity to play just like that for the entirety of the series it's every not like map he's yeah like a, yeah it's like he's not on some niche hero that just gets rotated in on a particular map Sojourn is such a mainstay for so many teams right now. Uh, good to say that Genji fills a similar role. I guess, you know, we probably wondered like what Malthal would be able to do on the Genji. Normally we've sort of seen him on the Tracer and now a lot of teams are starting to move away from that. Um, and Malthal obviously, there have definitely been a few matchups where Malthal struggled to hit the back line hard enough. Uh, definitely dealing with like elite Zens and, and uh, you know, other supports. Very, very difficult for him in some of these series to, to really rack up the numbers, but maybe the Genji represents an opportunity for him to yeah. start to stack those bodies up a little bit, but the uprising on defense here, no surprises with their composition. Right? We talked about Crimzo's aren't at the start of the game, and it's very much a Lucio Baptiste meta right now. And I think for both of these teams, I think what you've seen with the league right now, this seems to be, really it's just the Zarya, the Lucio and the Bap seems to be the consistent things with the meta. Sojourn, I would say, has played most of the time with it, and they'd kind of just throw your flanker in there, right? Uh, Sombra, Genji, Tracer, Reaper, like anybody in that kind of world. Uh, it just seems like the combination of the Lucio's speed and the mobility to get the Zarya in place with the Batiste able to stay alive for a long time is really impactful. And I mean, that is not the start you want if you're the Boston Uprising as it's Dove getting another first pick. This is what I'm saying about Malthal. Uh, he's had problems trying to do exactly that. Crimzo just in the one-to-one -one, able to win that out. Albeit, I mean, looked a bit fortunate from Malthal's POV, but yeah. hard to say. Crimzo gets yet another one there, and Paris looked like they'd be starting to open oh. things up after that Dove pick, but no. So, dude, like the, the BAP immortality field, the regenerative burst, that doesn't even take into account healing, getting from another support. It is so difficult to take out the Batiste. Like, yep. the burst incredibly is incredibly difficult as a Genji. The fact that you get so much health up front from that ability now, yeah, uh, it's just filthy. He has so many burst healing uh, abilities now. Pretty scary stuff. Dove again probing for another opener. Hoping to use the uh, the statue here as vantage, but he doesn't find it, and no one on the rest of his team does either. So, Krawi at least getting punk for his trouble, and maybe there's a chance to pressure a spawn advantage here, but Victoria now just lighting them up. Nah, Victoria cleaning up, and they've had, uh, you can tell Paris, they're having a really difficult time, like, getting punk away from that statue area. Uh, he's already at the graft, Krawi, 68%, as he's been able to get extremely charged up, whether it's, you know, bubbles on himself or protecting his supports. Uh, and just so tanky, really not able to dislodge him from this statue area. You see he's able to cut off the left and the right. Dove with another first pick, though. 
Graviton Surge here from Punk. This should even the scale somewhat, but Malvo's able to find Seeker. So despite that huge Zarya ultimate here, the Uprising are going to lose this fight. Fate trying to get away here, and Victoria really looking for exits at this stage. It's already one tick and counting for the Paris Eternal. Who will have a grab and all these other fantastic ultimates into the next phase of the map? Yeah. And it looks like uh, you know, is Boston trying to challenge this. You still have Victoria there. He's got a blade, and they're going to sound barrier. And they're going to force ultimates here. The Eternal have so much to work with. And Paris obliged. Three ultimates, four of them get used here by the Eternal. And then better hope it's going to be enough. Luke Minos lost any mortality fueled here, but Dove moves out to try and keep the capture going. Two ticks and change. But Dove gets forced away from the point, and the Uprising explode back into this defensive effort. And I like that decision there from the Boston Uprising. Worst case, you lose that fight, but you get all these ultimates out of the Paris Eternal. That Ant Matrix though in the corner, they were never able to get Crimzo, Punk, and Seeker out of that position. It's now everybody kind of back for the Paris Eternal. It's not even really like a fight reset. They're just going to go in and try and challenge this again. You see Punk's trying to stand on his own two feet there, but he still gets burned down. There's not enough healing there for him. And even though the Uprising slowed the Eternal down, they forced those ultimates out. Not able to hold for long enough. It's still worth, I think, like taking that early fight that, uh, you know, Boston did and like challenging yet again, because it gets all those ultimates out. You have a better chance of holding here in the street space. Like imagine they give up that point, right? And you know, you would add a fight at the choke and Paris has grab, beat, blade, like, you know, they would have had like a matrix, like, and there would have been no shot. Uh, you give yourself a much better chance to hold before this B checkpoint with the way they played that. Plenty of time to build up. Their next set of ultimates. Faith shuts Malfoy down again. He is cut down on his way to the back line. Faith far from done, though. Really the fixer when it comes to Brig. Mercy, Lucio. Kind of does it all. And now uh, it will be another occasion on which the Eternal are uh, bundled out of this part of the map. So uh, I, I don't know what you have to do if you're like Malfa to be able to stay alive, right? So uh, every time he goes in, tries to make a play, yeah, whether it's Faith, Crimzo, some help from Seeker there, just really difficult uh, on Malta to really make anything happen here on the Genji where uh, you gotta like maybe like eventually switch off. Malta will try to stand his ground here against Victoria's Blade. It'll be the sound barrier for the Paris Eternal now. Graviton Surge there. Punk lets that one go. Victoria trying to capitalize. Luke Mino, yeah, stuck in the corner. No chance of escape. And again, Paris are deflected. Okay. Yes, I mean, you still don't even have a, a blade here from Malthal as uh, Victoria ends up using his there. Sound barrier as well. Uh, beats from both sides. So, Cry maybe with this grab. So grab, you know, with the overclock, uh, you know, disruptor shot from the Sojourn, and then the overclock. Being able to just do like loads of damage through it. That's a possibility here. Uh, and then you can save that blade for the final fight before checkpoint B as Boston. You see, they're backing up. Oh, -ho -ho. they're looking for that early grab, I guess, but. The Boston Uprising were ready for it. They also have an immortality field around the corner, Matt. So Paris yeah. can't get rid of it. That grab gets completely stuffed. Yeah, so what happens is, is like they kind of back up and Paris thinks that they can like run in and grab, like kind of chase them out. Uh, and Crimzo drops like an ant matrix right on the corner. So when Crawley goes up and uses the grab, uh, it just gets like deleted there by all the damage coming through that ant matrix. Paris are in trouble now. 52 seconds left in the round, and a Dragon Blade to hang their hats on. Malthal better make it happen. He's looking to go in, and that's basically how things have gone for him for this entire series. Sad but true, as the Paris Eternal can only ride the thin end of the blade to victory there, and it's just not enough. Yeah, like, what do you, like, what do, you do here uh, if you're the Paris Eternal, right? You're having a difficult time getting through this choke. 30 seconds on the clock. You're really down nothing to work with. I think you really got to consider, like, maybe this composition going into that next half. Like, is the Genji uh, something you want to, you know, keep going with? You can maybe even try the Tracer. Malfoy diving, gets a bubble. So this time, doesn't die on his way to the back line. Punk Graviton Surge here. Your win condition, Malfoy, is to deflect it. Ah, well, better not next time. He does have the deflect, but it's a little too late. And Punk's able to burn him down. Fate looking a little bit low there, but the Immortality Field Wants really helping Boston stay in this. The Immortality Field down, Punk gets Luke Mino now as well. Dub has to come alive in a big way to get Paris to keep moving. Rack Attack, Soundberry does come up with good timing, but Seeker has the perfect vantage in that fight just to ruin the Eternal. And he absolutely delivers in that regard. Paris are going to be stopped midway through the map. Very unconvincing attack.
Yeah, it, it was not great. Even with Dove being able to get some first picks, really just on that point A, uh, not able to get it right away, uh, not able to capitalize, right? Like, what was it, the first or second fight? Uh, Dove gets an early pick and everything kind of falls apart. I think Crimzo actually makes some big plays, being able to take out Malthal and whatnot. But uh, you've got to capitalize on those. And then I think uh, as well, like, if you're not getting value out of the Genji, you got to consider going to something else. What's it going to be? I mean, uh, I'll be honest so with we've you. We've seen them play the Tracer a bit. Oh, um, but, I mean, yeah. It's tough, right? The, gets back to Genji's, Genji's typically been better always, like, on King's Row because of the high ground, right? The, being able to access that high ground. So, like, uh, you, you may feel like you need the Genji to be able to go up there and try and challenge and make those plays. So, Boston, uh, we'll see what they decide to do on offense. A uh, few interesting things they can pull out, but still some time. So, Paris on defense. Uh, pretty much standard from what we've seen thus far from teams. Yeah. Paris here know that they really need to get off to a great start here defensively. I wonder, yeah, do we see Boston maybe try and like avoid the Zarya? What is... Punk Winston, that would be a... <laughs> that would be quite a, quite a sight, I must say. Obviously we saw Itzel, uh, for the most part on this team, take that roll up. Punk, though, has shown he's more than up to the challenge, though, of demonstrating a wide and deep hero pool. No, Seeker on the Sojourn again. Yeah. I, I think you just want that Zarya for, like, the second stage of the map as well. That if you can win this fight, if you're the Boston Uprising, and let's say, you know, keep Punk highly charged, you know, build up towards the grab, and, you know, have it for that second half, you're in a fantastic spot. Is I mean, that that's a massive kill. I mean, the, the point should kind of just, like, crumble now, uh, barring Paris pulling out, like, some insane, uh, you know, wins here. But you know, once you lose that Batiste, we talked about how big, like, the burst healing is, the immortality field, uh, losing the Batiste at the start. It's almost like worst case, right? Yeah. Seeker is having an incredible map. 64% charge shot accuracy on this Sojourn. That is mental. Dove only about half of that, just to put it in perspective for you. Very, very hard here to, to sort of deal with a deficit like that. That's just a, a gigantic DPS spike that... Boston have access to and are leveraging it maliciously. As now they have an eternity, it feels like, here with, you know, five minutes plus on the clock to get to that you know, golden box of victory. And what do you decide to do here, right? You can just kind of, like, trade this damage out. You know, maybe you're just going to try and build up towards that grab. The slight advantage already. Oh, Melthal! Victoria goes deep there, and he's into the back like Crow. He just decides to give up on dealing with the Genji. Punk representing a far greater threat to him at the moment, but the immortality field thrown down by Paris is going to be removed here, and they are getting absolutely ruined. Yes, yeah, so we have a switch now off of the Genji, so just I think this is just trying to get back, but I mean, that's like terrible to lose that fight in the way you just did. I mean, you lose, you know, both your DPS instantly pretty much, and then you just kind of have to give it up. And at the spot where the Golden Box of Victory is, I mean, you're going to have everything available here for the Boston Uprising, and you haven't even had good fights to build up anything of your own. Seeker, he's the one I'm looking out for right now. Yeah. Hey, looking for no snitch, Matt. Just those easy kills, and he's had plenty of them so far this map. Rack attack just impales himself upon that particle lance. And Victoria will take to the skies to deal with Luke Mino. That was a wash. <laughs> Mouthful will be cleaned off the point, and that's the map. Uh, I was laughing at uh, Seeker emoting on the payload as Mouthful <laughs> trying to stall it. Uh, <laughs> trying to kill it. Right around him. <laughs> <laughs> Not even trying to kill him, but look, I, I think that that game is, you know, the Boston Uprising being able to pick off players, you know, really Crimson in that first point and then the DPS early uh, on their offensive attack and really just snowball. I mean, had so many ultimates to use there. And, and I think you see, you know, in map one, Dove got the better of Seeker in terms of that Sojourn battle and that led to a Paris win. In the second map, it's a complete opposite, which leads to a Boston Uprising victory. Yeah, pretty convincing stuff from Boston there, and they get a lot of value out of their composition. Shows us why they're probably feeling pretty comfortable in this particular metagame right now. And Paris are fundamentally not on the same level on King's Row, so don't even think about high-level strategy. Paris now need to be able to uh, approach these compositions from a place of confidence and believe they can win these fights, because right now there doesn't seem to be showing. Stick around, everybody. We have a tied series here at one apiece, but Boston definitely seem to have the edge.
Kings Row sees the Boston Uprising really start to pull ahead in this matchup. We only really get to see about half of the map of the Paz Eternal uh, are just brought to a screeching halt midway through the map on their attack. And then Boston, with what looked like the utmost ease, are able to match and, and beat that kind of progress, Matthew. Paris, again, really clutching it, trying to find ways to put real pressure on this Boston team who seems to get to do whatever they like. And you're just like, what happened with the Boston Uprising in like map number one? Like, were they just like off a little bit? Was it a little bit of a fluke? Or like, was it like, are we in for like an actual like close like series? Because that's kind of what it looked like here at the start that, you know, with the way Dove was playing today and the rest of the Paris Eternal that now this is one that could go the difference. Maybe they could even steal. Uh, but what we just saw on King's Row was not exactly that. Uh, it, it was just really kind of like one side of there from the Boston Uprising. And I think if you were the, the Paris Eternal, like uh, how can you get Maltel in positions to try and make plays uh, without him being like extremely weak almost to the point of death, uh, like before he gets in those positions? Probably worth also pointing out that this match so far has been decided by Sojourns being very powerful uh, on the first couple of maps. First it was Dove, uh, a veritable highlight reel for Dove on that Busan map, and then Seek is the one that really takes center stage uh, in a big way. A lot of flashiness coming from that Sojourn play, but the sheer volume as well as of eliminations and damage done in general has also uh, been quite a big factor. Paris, not going to change anything up here on defense. And this may be a better map uh, for Mothal on the Genji because uh, we were talking a little bit in the break, like maybe it's just kind of like the pathing, right? And, uh, you know, just taking like loads of damage, whether it be from uh, the Sojourn or the Batiste on the opposite side before even getting in position to really make a high impact play, uh, where there's a lot of open space here on this map, right? So a lot of different routes you could possibly take, use here as a uh, super attack, getting on the high ground, maybe in a position to boot these players down. Okay, so nice. Paris Quite nice. really want to play very close. The Zaya position here is nice. Rack attack. We'll still need to respect what Boston can do here. Because we already have the Victoria Genji drop to the cart, which will start moving. Rack, please. Okay, he's done well. Ooh, Surfing off the, uh, yeah, off the rooftop. But he'll be healed up in no time. That's not an issue. Huh. Yeah, well, this... Again, take a fight close to the enemy spawn and guarantee yourself another one uh, a little bit further down the track here, I guess, is Paris's plan because... I mean, they posture aggressively. Uh, none of that really manifests in their play, though. They get run over. Rack attack, though, getting involved. Finding Crimzo is important. Yeah, and I don't think they, they probably expected Punk to, like, you know, Zarya jump and boost himself up to the high ground. Probably a lot of damage that they didn't expect uh, coming through there. Uh, up on that high ground area where Punk gets up there, he's, like, pretty charged, you know, 70 80%, and he's able to take out the Genji rather fast, so... Paris will get at least one more fight here uh, before the payload would hit the second checkpoint. So we'll see if they're able to kind of like make it out and make a play before. As, uh, they've already used one bubble here, the Paris Eternal. Gonna have to wait a little bit here. Yeah, you see, even they force out the immortality field. The player's taking so much damage. Well, just to keep Malfoy alive, Matthew. He got a bubble as well, so it's not like he's not getting defensive, uh, you know, utility. He's <laughs> just getting blown up. Good focus from Boston to make sure that uh, that Genji can't get the job done. Punk here has to respect Crowey, but Crowey is in between Punk and the rest of the uprising and just gets shot in the back. Punk able to stay alive here, doing very well to juggle this aggression. Damn, that's a good look. The boy's on his home turf, my guy. Tree. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, pretty clean there from Punk as uh, Crimzo will escort the payload in, take that A checkpoint as Punk, he's pushed up, and that is a bit too far as uh, Paris, they get all that front spawn, and they push right out, and they're like, hey, uh, we, we can't get bullied that bad, right? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, they end up taking out Punk, so he actually loses all that energy, which is quite big. A little frustrating there to, to lose that as Punk, but there's a Graviton Surge here. Again, again, getting Paris off the high ground is kind of annoying in this position. Crowley, I like this, all right? Start the fight off here on the right foot, come forward. They've lost Dove somehow, though. Just not, shouldn't be happening. Crowley is the one that grabs. He stays alive to the sound barrier. Gonna keep him in the fight, and here's Mouthful. Feels like he's just joined us now in the land of the living. Can't say the same for his two victims as he finds both Desire and the Genji. Ah, uh, the yeah, Lucio, 
Yeah, he's able to get two with that blade. A lot used there, though, by the Paris Eternal, man. Uh, Ant Matrix, Beat, Grav, Blade. I mean, Boston, they're going to come back. I mean, they're going to have, you know, you're not even going to have to use everything here. I mean, you know they have no beat. You think, hey, you know, we can get, uh, you know, even if it's one here with a grab, like, do you even need to invest anything else? Punk double bubbling himself here. Is he's definitely the the main uh, target for the Paris That's, Eternal. Yeah. And they don't have to invest anything else into this fight. They can hold on to that blade. They can hold on to the ant matrix. Uh, in Paris, because the fight's in so fast, there's no opportunity for them to even like build up towards anything, right? So you're looking at an opportunity where Boston, they can actually kind of snowball through this second part of the map. Yeah, two fights with alt advantage seems pretty sweet for the Uprising, and that might be all they need to actually get into this last phase of the map here. Saw how far forward Punk wanted to push. The high ground absolutely under control of the Uprising here. Paris have to move through a choke. Oh, nah, they're not. They're not coming out of that room. They're going to have to take to the low ground here and try and wrap around, but they're still going to be within Seeker's purview. Yep, Balthal. Well, eats that one. <laughs> he says, okay, I'll, I'll, there. Yeah. Oh, I'll just meet my maker. No worries. And Victoria, get me Sushi Chef on here. And, and that's kind of the snowball, right? You use so many ultimates there for that first defense. Maybe they felt they need to because they kind of felt everything kind of like falling apart and they needed a stop but you know you end up losing two fights relatively easily there uh, and now they get the second checkpoint as they march down the map and again now what are they running up against okay Paris are starting to build up some of those ultimates but uh, still nothing that a world placed immortality field can't interrupt Crow we needed the sound barrier of rack attack there I think uh, to sort of allow the eternal to win that previous fight plus mouthful's blade so this will buy the Eternal some time, but it's not going to translate into a fight win. It's not going to translate into more free alt charge. Yeah, so that just kind of like delays a little bit here. Uh, you know, that Ant Matrix up on the high ground, but I mean, if you're the boss in Uprising, what do you do here? I mean, you're going to have another grab here. So Punk, because you're actually able to put down so much damage and live a little bit longer in these fights, you're going to have another grab here before Paris gets one. Uh, and you have this beat to use if you want to just get aggressive and just kind of like run them down with sound barrier. Pretty patient stuff here from Punk. He doesn't want to give up this high ground too easily. In fact, he'd rather snarl Crowy up inside this grab. Sound barrier comes down and it's not enough. Oh, that's got to feel terrible for Rack Attack. He still loses the majority of his the team to that grab on the high ground. And, and there's a part of me that thinks that they probably didn't have grab again. Because you just saw the grab, uh, you know, there's like that one fight, like grab takes a little bit to build up. Yeah. But Punk has been so charged, and they've been able to keep him alive throughout all of this. You're you're going to have that grab rather fast. And uh, now when Paris Eternal comes back, right, you have a grab, you'll be able to kind of counter that with the sound barrier. And, and with the way Seeker shooting, maybe sitting up on the high ground, just one shot away from really taking the game over. Two minutes and three on the clock here, but there's Dove, finally! Shot. Feels like he's gone completely quiet since that first map. But getting Crimzo, it's about the best kill we could hope for there, Matt. And you can hold on to the grab, right? So, I, I think actually Dove, like, regardless, even with the uh, maps they've lost, I thought he's actually played pretty well today. Uh, I know, even on King's Row, right? He was getting some first picks, just not able to convert them into anything, as uh, now Paris, you know, a minute and 30 on the clock, still with the blade, still with the grab. You're, you're in a much better shot to hold now. How do you make use of this, I wonder? Okay, so grab here from Crowey, Immortality Field. There's Dub, but there's Seeker. Okay, both Genji's oh, down and all oh, that's nasty. Oh. He shuts down the Genji and then puts one through Luke Mino's head. What a disgusting showing from Seeker here. Oh yeah, they're getting home well and truly. What a power play from Boston. Yeah, and that, that blade actually could have been a difference maker, right? He had uh, an opportunity to get right onto the supports in the back line. It was after the beat. Uh, but Dan just hits another shot. Uh, Seeker really starting to... You no, know, his map one was not good. I think Dove definitely got the better of him. But since then, I mean, Seeker's been on fire. What a sequence. <laughs> Shutting down the Genji blade and then just one-shotting the Baptiste. It's like the two most high-priority targets in that fight, especially given the ultimates. Damn, that's dirty. Good looks for Boston. Getting the map done. <laughs> Job not finished out in the chat there. Okay. <laughs> These two teams, obviously, uh, again, trying to enjoy themselves a little bit. Boston, obviously, looking ahead 
to their first play-in matchup against a rather frightening-looking Florida Mayhem. And Paris here wanting to cap their season off by doubling their wins. So far, though, a little bit lackluster here, especially in Malthus just had some poor luck, I think. I mean, just getting... What do you want to what, yeah. like, what do you want to say about dying to that rail gun, man? I mean, I just I just don't have it in me to blame Malthus for that in the slightest. And also, like, yeah, Punk has been so charged up the entire time, and obviously can't deflect that. What is he gonna do? Play Genji at range? It needs to go in, try and make something happen. Uh, it's a tough spot to be in. Ah, okay. Interesting if we get this from Paris here. Hmm. I wonder why Duff values the Ash over the Sojourn though. This may be just to come out of the spawn here with like the Ash with the Mercy Pocket. Oh, that's Bay a missed opportunity. Damage down, yeah. That dynamite goes off, and no one's there to uh, the, be affected The dynamite by it. on the high ground, right, would have at least, uh, you know, gotten one bubble out, maybe the regenerative burst, right? You could have gotten some of the cooldowns to, out, and maybe you could have attacked that, uh, but not able to connect. Now, now you're in this kind of like awkward dance here. Victoria is the one that will contest here, so you'll need bubbles. Losing Crimson to Dove, though, means that this spawn camp is going to go about as well for Boston as it did for Paris. Maybe worse. Yeah. I, I mean, it actually went probably better for Paris. Lasted a little bit longer. It's uh, you know, Duff opened things up with a pick. Is that time they, you know, Maltel ends up living. They give him the Zarya bubble. He gets to the high ground, gets out with his life as uh, Victoria trying to contest the payload. It was in a really tough spot. Someone had to do it though. Uh, no point standing out there in the high ground if the car just sails on by you. Victoria challenging Malthul here, who is in trouble. Gets a bubble though from Krabi. Good awareness, but. Punk has the high ground control, and Malthul can't escape. Good work by Crimzo, weaving in those healing grenades with the shots. Yeah, and there's only so much you can do to try and, uh, you know, you, you give the Genji the Zarya bubble. You know, you got an immortality oh. field if necessary, right? But it's only so much you can do to try and keep him up, especially you know, as the Zarya starts to chase down that, uh, with that extra damage. As, you know, Punk with a bubble takes a few shots there and then just backs up. Now yeah, Malthul, he dashes. He's at low health, he gets a bubble, but still, the fact that he can't get away there is pretty scary. Genji on the back foot, doesn't feel fun to play at all. I mean, Victoria is constantly challenging Malthor, saying, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dash through you, I'm gonna try and hit you with some shurikens, make it hard for you to do your job. Krawi disintegrates there. Two air matrices go up, but one a little bit better position than the other, I'd say. I mean, you have that high ground advantage, right? I mean, it's just kind of like the defensive nature of the map. I mean, you would love to be able to use it more on the high ground rather than that. You know, kind of blind corner you have to turn. Yeah, no doubt about that. Really hard for Paris to find a way to pin Boston down inside the range of the Ant Matrix. So, one minute, 37 seconds left here. And Paris no closer to really finding an answer. Outside of Dove finding a miracle. Pick here, this could be rough. Crowy, how many bubbles you got, sir? All right, one down. Dove removed by Victoria before the sound barrier comes in for Rack Attack. That's so demoralizing. Again, it's another beat that can't quite come in time to save one of his teammates. The blades come out, Malthul finds one without having to give up his life, but Victoria is able to outdo him in that regard. And Boston still feet firmly planted on this defensive endeavor. Uh, but you have an opportunity here for the Paris Eternal. Uh, you're going to have your Graviton Surge, you're walking in there. They have nothing to use to defend against this. Uh, really just the immortality field at that point, which you think you're able to take that out. Punk's probably going to save some bubbles to be able to live on through it. So you know, potentially an opportunity here for the Paris Eternal to take checkpoint A. Here's the man of the moment, Krawi. Can he make the difference? He tries to circumvent Punk and... Okay, grab comes in. Immortality field removed instantly. That's lovely from Paris. Great execution. The card not moving through that fight though, so there might be a chance for Boston to, to rush and get here in time. So what I like there is that Paris uses the speed boost, they get right up in Punk's grill, and they basically force them to use those Zarya bubbles before the grab comes down, and they know they have nothing else to live through it, but you lose Cry at the end, he's gotta switch to D.Va to come back, and you're gonna have another fight. A Matrix there. Little hard to LOS, but Victoria, no fear. Dove gets it with a deflect, if I'm not mistaken now. The Immortality Fuel gonna help keep him up. It's still dicey stuff though. Look how low the Eternal are. They're able to get rid of Crimzo though. But Seeker and Victoria strike back just as quickly. And without Rack Attack, Paris are running out of options. 
Two versus two on the cart now. Victoria into the deflect. Krawi desuited. Can't do too much. And Malthal on his own. Last samurai. And it's not enough. The Boston Uprising put Paris in that red dirt. Oh, it's, uh, you know, you lose, if you have Krawi alive there, where, you know, he ends up dying really at the end of that, uh, you know, last second fight, so to speak, and he has to come back on the D.Va. If he lives on that Zarya there, you probably walk that in. We're still playing that game, but that last exit kill just so impactful. 17 final blows for five deaths for Punk in that map and 16 for Victoria. Really good showing from Boston. And now it's the Zarya that takes the four. Another great look. And for Paris Eternal, again, it's much the same woes they've suffered so far. When they get the execution right, at the end of that round, the cart's not close enough to the checkpoint for them to convert that into a take. And winning multiple fights in a row is something Paris are just not able to do so far this series. Boston Uprising looking to put the finishing touches on this one as Paris will continue to tread water and search for an answer.
Want to go to the grand finals? Well, submit a duet or a stitch with our content to enter the OWL TikTok sweepstakes for a chance to be there. Head to our website or visit the Overwatch League TikTok for more info. You know what that is, Matt? TikTok, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know, yeah, Bren's got one. I, I know a bunch of people got one. I don't have one, but I hear it's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty lit. Right, many hours of my day just get I can't do more social media. I am social media. What do you mean? You don't do I, any I am, social I'm at media. The, the limit of my. You're, all you do is tweet about the New York Giants. That is the only thing you do. What do you mean? No, no more. So, <laughs> no, no, oh no more. <laughs> All right, you heard it, ladies and gentlemen. Matt has done his dash for the social media. Just unfollow him and be done with it. But check that out if you want a chance to beat the grand finals. Don't do that. Man, I mean, international LAN event. Mm, that's what I'm talking about, baby. I'm looking forward to that. We'll, uh, again, to follow off of the success we've had at some awesome live events this year, great to move away from domestic and have everyone there. Uh, fingers crossed now as we head into this match, of course. Three maps are down. And uh, maybe the spirits of the Eternal are as well because they, man... They really struggled to find a rhythm over the last two maps. Bro, like, yeah, where is the map one Paris Eternal? Like, they looked they looked really solid. I think it's like once the game is like sped up a bit, I think that's when things fell apart. Because remember how we were talking about like how slow that map one was, right? Yeah. Uh, it was a lot of like, you know, uh, posturing, kind of like exchanging some long range shots. Not a lot of like kills, like uh, r really just a game of positioning where I think as soon as we kind of got past that and it's like, all right, everybody moving at a thousand miles an hour, that's when things have fallen apart for Paris is uh, not great for them. We're going into push. I mean, nonstop action and push. Yeah, maybe a chance for Paris to find their footing a little bit more. Maybe it's, in terms of that Oldham economy, it's still going to be a persistent factor like it is on, on sort of escort maps in general. I bring this up because Paris looked really solid on control. Uh, that was where I really liked the looks from them. Uh, just trying to take the fight constantly to Boston. They'll have opportunities to do that now here as well, but Boston looking much more coordinated. They're getting a lot more success out of Victoria on the Genji as well. So uh, if we get that again, like I'm definitely backing Victoria if, if I had to choose a, a Genji who's having higher impact in this so, particular but, but matchup. But you don't need the Genji on this map. So if you don't want to play the Genji, you don't have to here if you're Paris. You can actually play that Tracer, which I think we've seen better stuff from Mopo, uh when he's playing the Tracer. So... Looks to be what uh, he's kind of hovering here from the onset. Uh, and I wonder if Boston has an idea on that because, you know, coming out with the 76 in the Sojourn, it's a bit better of a comp against the Tracer versus, like, you know, playing this, like, almost like double, I hope Sojourn's not really hit scan, but kind of, like, occupies that space. But playing, you know, two of those against a Genji, like, that's typically where the Genji would thrive. All right, neutral fight here. Seeker strikes first, though. And he finds, again, the perfect bloody target. Victoria is able to play, again, an off angle here, and it's just too much for Paris. They just crumble under this kind of pressure. Yeah, you lose the bath, and then that allows the soldier to take a big off angle. You don't have that burst healing. You're just going to get wilted down. Red eventually is... Uh, see now, so the, the bot starts to move the barrier closer towards the checkpoint. <laughs> Just nailing what? the play-by-play -play there. <laughs> I love yeah. that. Yeah, hey, don't forget. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I was doing it, right? Yeah, yeah, that yeah that's, that's how we do it. Yeah. Uh, I've got to say as well, like, Victoria are obviously typically the hits game player on this team alongside Valentine, so this is like a really natural uh, move for him. Nah, I mean, ha ha the, the immortality feels so far away. I mean, how are they I, supposed to live through that? I don't know what the idea was supposed to be there, Matt. I'll be honest with you. Dove able to find Victoria though. Unfortunately, that's not going to stop the Boston Uprising here. That will be annoying though, losing control of the bot here. But as the fight breaks down, I think it was like a three versus one at the end. So a little annoying, but Boston will be able to extend that lead and they're already pretty close to the checkpoint. So Paris definitely need to get something going now. Victoria's legs are going to get him back into the fight pretty darn quickly. And I mean, probably getting like doubled up here in terms of grad, right? I mean, 50%, Punk's already got it. It looked like they wanted to save it, but they're, they're going to have to use it. Ooh, a lot going on there. Malthal actually able to get Seeker with the Pulse Bomb. I think he missed it, but still got what he came for. No checkpoint picked up uh, there Victoria's by Boston. Victoria's going to buy through this? And he's getting value. He's found two already. Dove has to hide the bot. Uh, and they got the checkpoint <laughs> off the back of that attack visor. Dude, You've got to be kidding me, it's dude. A, it's a 2v3 at that point, right? Because uh, well, I think like, Malthal's still alive. 
Uh, it's just Victoria and Crimzo. Crimzo is like behind him by where the Mega Health Pack is. And, and, and I was shocked they invested that in because I mean, that looked like a fight that that was definitely going to be you know, lost. Is the Seeker here is going to be an overclock. It's going to be Sound Barrier response here for the Paris Eternal as both of these teams want to continue the fight. Seeker is hitting so many rails here, Matt, that that sound barrier just gets stripped away pretty quickly. Both teams end up using it, though, to be fair. But Boston see no reason to stop trying to push here. Malthul's done a good job so far this map. I think you're getting those picks first, the Pulse Bomb, now that elimination on Victoria. But it's a big, big, big deficit that the Paris Eternal is staring down now with the loss of that checkpoint early. Yeah, Boston just ends up kind of throwing bodies there at the end, just burning some clock as... 57% you know, not even halfway through the game yet pretty good first initial push there from the Boston Uprising as Victoria trying to take this off angle here. Oh nice grab use Immortality field though Gets some value and now allows for a trade. How is Dove close enough? I guess he must have slid into the fight to try and find an extra kill and ends up getting himself picked off Not great a graph that results in a, a one-for-one -one trade not what Paris are looking for and matrices thrown up Luke Minos is down already here. Or he's in mortality field, excuse me. Seeker picks that off. And guess where the bot's headed, Matt? Back in the direction of Paris' spawn. Yeah, not, not the direction they would like. Um, especially now because, you know, Boston, they win that fight for you know, relatively free almost. As, you, you know, you'll have your grab and your overclock yet again as uh, getting very close once they get this checkpoint, I think. I think that you lose this fight for Paris, you're in a spot where you may end up giving up the entire map. Well, Crowey's bought the farm already. Punk just rides straight up on him there. Seeker's been hitting so many of these. Another one. Dove gets eliminated very easily, and Lushmino is nothing but a crater. And there's nothing that you can do about that. I mean, just kind of going back to your spawn, the Sojourn just comes flying around the corner. Takes you out. Here's what's going to be deadly, though. I mean, you're going to have this tack visor, lots of open space here. They're going to have to play in that open space to contest the bot. You're really looking at Dub to hit like one of those big railgun shots with an overclock to shut it all down. Victoria coming back a little bit here. Healed up by the biting fielder. Now it's time to come with the tack visor. This is going to force out that sound barrier. Pretty good trade, I think, if you're the Boston Uprising. Especially with Seeker getting rid of Crowy anyway. So many times, sound barrier being dropped and not allowing Paris to have an outright fight win. This is going to be the case again. Crimson's picked off Dove. Mouthful again, putting in a, a really gutsy effort here, but again, he finds himself well behind the April in numbers. And the biggest thing for me is you see how fast the Paris Eternal, uh, uh, how fast the Boston Uprising are able to deal with Cry, right? And get him out of these fights. And Punk, w with the help of the support, it's able to just live forever, it seems like. Never fighting without their Zarya. Is, uh, now they, they back up a little bit. Victoria will come back on the Genji here. Just trying to get back in the fight a little bit faster. They'll give up some space so they can set up another fight. And Matrix here. Boston, no interest in giving up any ground. No interest in going easy on the Eternal whatsoever. Another mouthful Pulse Bomb that finds its mark though. Another good sign from him. Crimson having to reload here. This is going to mean the Uprising back away. They've only got three players to work with, and that Genji switch for Victoria hasn't yet found any value. No, I mean, it was just one fight, and I think really just the Genji to get back fast. I don't think it was like a... Because no, uh, he was hovering the Reaper there for a second, and then decided to go with Genji, so... High ground control here from the Boston Uprising. Paris, and I like this from Boston, because it's going to force Paris to, yeah, I was going to say, to invest to try and actually get the fight going in their direction. So they end up using the grab just to solo grab Punk. Whatever keeps the Eternal uh, in fighting shape here. Front spawn will be shut down from the Boston Uprising, and Paris able to turn a grab this time at least into a fight win. In the past, it's... Not been a guarantee that Crowley's been able to secure a victory for his team with that ultimate. Punk. And once you get the checkpoint, Mitch, it's actually the scariest part for the opposing team because at this point, Paris is forced to pretty much, with the time on the clock and where they are in terms of the game, dump everything into like every fight almost. And Boston does not have to do that at all. You lose one of those, this bot's gonna go so fast in the other direction and they'll most likely have an ultimate advantage. Well, that's how you're looking and see like a lot of teams complete maps at this stage in the game. Victoria dies so early in that fight, again, unsuccessful. This is what Paris are looking for. This is gonna secure them the checkpoint now. 
be able to win a couple of these fights in a row. So big. Victoria's getting close to that blade, but he's had some really unsuccessful engagements. Both teams able. This, this is doable for Paris. I mean, Ant Matrix here coming up. Overclock as well. And you're just going to kind of like maybe wait and bait them because uh, you see Boston, they're going to be able to control this high ground. Now that you've got the checkpoint, uh, do you back up a little bit, try and get a good use of that Ant Matrix? It looked like Malto coming around on a little bit of a flank with that Pulse Bomb yet again. It's hit a few of those. Here goes Victoria. It's about time he made something happen on this pick and the blade is good so far. Lucamino gets a closer shave than he otherwise would have liked. And now to get the pendulum swinging back in the other direction. Yeah, as they ended up using everything there, Paris, and they kind of needed to, especially now under two minutes. They'll come back, they'll have a grab here uh, for potentially like kind of their final defensive fight, you would think. Um, they're going to have to go pretty fast here because like you're, you're running all the time. The time you're wasting here, you're allowing Punk to end up building up towards his grab. Benefit for them is they know that there's no sound barrier on the other side, so Crawley's going to be able to use this grab pretty, uh, pretty liberally, right? Like kind of using it wherever. Ah, oh, you lose Maltel. Yeah, not a great way to start the fight off. Immortality Field, Krabi spent so much time being the literal only person trying to remove that. And yeah, all that DPS spent on the drone can't be used on Punk, who sat in the grab, smiling from ear to ear. The body's still going to move, and Gotti moves fast now, all the way up this hill. It's going to be burning rubber. Ah, oh, yeah, and Lucamino, you know, you're able to get the kill on that Victoria, but you're going to lose Maltel as well as two players go down here right at the end. Is Boston Uprising very close to completing the map. They're no key ultimates here for Boston, but they're in a pretty solid position regardless. Less than a minute left and Boston say, fine, we'll let you have it. We'll let you come down the hill and we'll meet you at the bottom. I mean, this will be a comeback for the ages here. 40 seconds to go. They've doubled the amount of progress in terms of the meters. The Seeker right around the corner with a headshot. That's not a gap. That's a Grand Canyon from Seeker. Krabi getting picked off there as well. Sound barrier for three. It's a very, very, very sad beat to be dropping. Mouth all pressuring Crimzo here and... <laughs> oh, brother. No good. Now, bot Sound barrier available here for Boston 2 to complete the map. All right. Around the corner, Krabi waits. He does not want to let this bot end the map. Immortality field thrown down. Again, mouthful credit to him coming out of the spawn, still with that same hunger. But he's going to be dueling here. Seeker is... Seeker is emoting directly Oh, my God. Him. All right, he gets him, though. Okay. Yep. And... <laughs> Here's a grab that's going to catch Rack Attack, and the Barricade is going to be pushing overtime. May have gone down before this has a chance to finish the map, but the result is set in stone. And so, the Paris Eternal end their season just the one win to their name is the Boston Uprising. Clamber over them on their own quest for glory as they set themselves up with a fated matchup against the Florida Mayhem in our players. As, uh, no, right after that first map, it was all Boston. Uh, kind of Paris fell apart, but I thought you saw some good play from Dove today uh, from the Paris Eternal. I think Crowley when, you know, it, I mean, look, it's really difficult. I mean, I think Boston doing a great job of focusing him down you know, constantly losing supports early on. I thought he, you know, when they put him in the right positions, I actually thought he can kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Punk in situations. But uh, it just Boston, as you saw today, just display. I mean, just on another level in the Paris Eternal. Yeah, really impressed with Seeker's play. And now I understand why maybe Victoria is not the designated Sojourn player yeah. for this Boston Uprising team. And hey, he's able to turn around and, and show us Genji on quite a few of those mats and, and find good results. The Soldier also looked really solid on New Queen Street. Maybe a little bit less so, I think, uh, on Busan, as that was where Dove was really able to come alive here. These teams, you can really see how they rise and fall on the, the momentum generated by some of those star players, right? Yeah. I think that Boston, they're looking down the barrel of a Sojourn matchup in their next match, which is not going to be maybe so easy to overcome. Really curious to see just how far this team can go with what they have right now. Obviously, on the Paris Eternal side, that is the end of their season. I want to extend my thanks to the, the whole organization, the players, for all their hard work so far. It's been a treat to have them and, and see them uh, as they've tried to grow and, you know, dealt with quite a, some serious challenges over the course of the season. True. And uh, obviously, the name Paris being retired now as they uh, 
as they make a relocation. But let's talk about the Boston Uprising. Let's talk about their player of the match here, Matthew. Tough one to choose. I think a lot of players really able to stand up here. Really enjoyed seek his play. Uh, but as the as it as it happens, we're landing on Punk here for your player of the match. Really solid series throughout. Still the go-to guy for the Boston Uprising at the tank roll. I mean, look, they're able to keep him alive for so long. He does an excellent job kind of managing the Zarya bubbles, whether it be for him or to help those supports. Uh, and I thought really, though, kind of, it's, it starts with Punk and really kind of Crimzo as well, where uh, the, the Batiste, the perfect time of the immortality fields, you know, the healing able to keep Punk alive, but just the amount of damage he's able to put out. And you saw it constantly when Malta was trying to get away. I mean, it, he's getting beamed down by like a 90 energy Zarya, and he's already at half health. Like, what do you expect from the guy? I mean, just a really strong Zarya play from Punk. And I think if Boston's going to make it out of the play-ins, I think you're going to need to see this type of performance again against even tougher composition, uh, competition. Yeah, again, uh, they'll spend some time dwelling on the satisfaction of a win here. But they have to look ahead. Uh, 12 final blows per 10, by the way. Pretty uh, pretty insane. I think a lot of that generated probably on Junker, Junker Town, rather, where Punk ends up with like 17, even I the, think, over the course of the series, on the map, right? Even the average energy is pretty high, right? You know, 52%, uh, it's pretty strong in terms of, you know, being able to just, I mean, if that's the average, right, you're kind of sitting at above that for a, a good portion of the games, right? So uh, that's going to say you see him, he's able to put down so much damage there. Yeah, no doubt about it. The Boston Uprising, uh, you know, half an eyebrow still raised for this team, and... There are some serious hurdles that they have to clear if they even want to be a part of the playoffs here at the Overwatch League. But at least they have a path to potential glory. Yeah. They know what they need to work on. We want to see how they're able to make adaptations in the meantime. We're going to head to a break, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when we come back, of course, we've still got one more game left for the regular season. So don't go too far. This is your final day of Countdown Cup qualifiers here at the Overwatch League. The Overwatch League is brought to you by Upper Deck the official trading card of the Overwatch League. And by TeamSpeak, the official voice supplier of the Overwatch League.
Welcome to Game Break, everybody. I'm here with Faith from Boston Uprising after coming from a 3-1 victory against the Paris Eternal Faith. Congratulations on the win. Now, I do have to ask, you know, you guys seemed really dominant throughout the whole match other than the first map on Busan. So I want to ask you, uh, you know, what sort of adjustments did you guys make after losing Busan and going into King's Row? 자, 오늘 일단 승리 너무나 축하드리고요. Faith 선수, 일단 어, 오늘 경기 굉장히 전체적으로 봤을 때 보스턴이 되게 압도적인 어떤 모습을 많이 보여준 것 같은데 어, 부산에서만 살짝 좀 이제 어, 힘들어하시는 모습이 좀 보였던 것 같아요. 이제 부산을 지고 나서 어, 이제 왕의 길로 들어가면서 좀 팀적으로 어떤 조정을 하셨나요? 어, 일단 부산이 첫 내비기도 했고 그래서 아직 손이 덜 풀린 것 같다. 실수만 좀 줄여보자 라는 식으로 충분히 할 만하니까 실수만 좀 줄이고 하자라는 식으로 이야기를 하고 들어갔던 것 같아요. All right. Uh, for Busan, I think we lost that match specifically because you know it was the first map of our uh, of our match today. Uh, and not only that, you know, I don't I don't think we were warmed up enough. So going in into King's Row, what we talked about mostly was you know lessening our mistakes, focus trying to you know trying to focus a lot more on the game and try to make as less mistakes as possible. And I think that's how we got the win against Paris Eternal today. All right. Uh, my second question for you is also. Going into next week, uh, you know, we are going into the playoff, season playoff, I uh, play-in, sorry. And you, your first opponent uh, for the play-in is going to be the Florida Mayhem. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on it. How confident are you going into that matchup against the Florida Mayhem? 자, 두 번째 질문으로는 이제 오늘로 정규 시즌 이제 끝나고 내일 이제 다음 주부터는 어, 플레이인 경기들이 시작이 될 텐데요. 보스턴의 어, 첫 상대가 플로리다 메이햄이라고 합니다. 어, 그 경기에 대해서 좀 어떻게 생각을 하시나요? 좀 이제 플로리다 상대로 좀 이길 수 있다는 좀 자신감이 있으신가요? 네, 이제 플로리다는 이번 스테이지에서 한번 이겨보기도 했고 그리고 또 같은 메타이기 때문에 다시 붙어도 이길 수 있을 것 같아요. Right. Uh, definitely, I do feel like we're gonna win. Uh, we could defeat the Florida Mayhem just because we won against them this stage once already. And not only that, it is we are going to be playing on the same meta, so I'm pretty confident uh, in our matchup against the Florida Mayhem in the play-ins. All right, Faith, that is it for the interview. Thank you so much for your time, and again, big congratulations on the win. 자 이걸로 인터뷰 마치도록 하겠습니다. 피트 선수 너무나 감사드립니다. Thank you. 감사합니다. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faith. Congratulations to the Boston Uprising. And Castle just couldn't wait to that get was, back into that frame. Was a, that was a sexy elbow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was, I, I, saw, I, saw, I saw skin right next to my face, and I was like, what is that? I was, like, <laughs> I was just like, I'm just doing some adjustments over here, and then all of a sudden I look at the camera, I'm like, oh. oh, oh. <laughs> the best part was the look that Reinforce gave me. He's just like, really? <laughs> we got the checkmate pose. Now we have the Costa pose with the elbows just leaning into other people. But technically, that's the baby bay, right? Yeah, it's yeah, the baby bay. Oh, oh, Remember? That's a throwback. That is wow. Well, we're old. Yeah. Yeah, which is HSM. Anyway, uh, let's actually let's let's take a look at uh, how that match went down. Boston Uprising came out on top, but not without Paris putting up a little bit of a fight, at, at least at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, at the first we were like, oh, is Paris going to do it? Because, uh, you know, this roster, this new roster hasn't really found too much success. They haven't been able to win a match. So we were hoping that this would be their final match, go out with a bang. Uh, unfortunately, after this first map, you know, they made the adjustments. They're playing a little bit faster, really reacting to the way the Paris Eternal are playing. And it just... It kind of fell away from the Paris Eternal. This has been a consistent theme throughout the season. So obviously it's been difficult for them to come in on such short notice to be able to play against the best of the best in a very new game with Overwatch 2 and 5v5. So, you know, hopefully we get to see a bunch of these plays again next year and they can hopefully get on a better performance. But Boston Uprising looking as dominant as ever going into the plane. Yeah, did, did Faith say in the interview that it was the first map of the day, the first one? The first yeah. map, I mean, it's the first map of the, of yeah. the match. Boston, book a warm-up script. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what are we doing? You know, I, I don't know if that was the exact answer, so I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, Kinda make a fact. It, it, it sounded like it. It, 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 it sounded no. like According that, if that is the case. Yes. translation. Yes, no, it was, yes. <laughs> oh, I, I don't want to blame Danny either if it's wrong. But I don't know. <laughs> anyway, you, you know, that's just a good factual statement. Like, book a warm-up scrim. I don't care if it did or it didn't. In any case, yeah, you know, come fix. on. Yeah, they, 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 they will for play-ins. Uh, definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm just joking. Um, 
Yeah, but for the Paris Eternal, I mean, this is a bit of a closure of their chapter, you know? They're going to stay the same franchise, they're just going to change their name, essentially, to yeah. Las Vegas, right? But still, it's the Paris Eternal. They were brought into the league in, in 2019, and they came out with their European roster, right? They had Ben Best, Cruz was on their roster yeah. soon, you know, transferred from LA Valley and to Paris Eternal, one of the crowd's favorite player in the Visit Arena. So, a lot of great moments from this team. Summer Showdown 2020 with Sparkle in the mix, for example. Remember Fielder? He was, like, all our own in, in Korea oh, yeah. when they when they won that tournament, you know? <laughs> Somebody... Oh, the seeker. Stop, stop. Just Oh, morning. 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 But yeah, it's going to be their last time this franchise competes as Paris Eternal. And they brought a lot of, you know, joy. Uh, they had some home stands yeah. even back in the day with the French audience, stuff like yeah. that, right? So some, some good times for this franchise too. Absolutely. Uh, they, uh, it was five years, uh, I guess, of... Uh, is it? No, wait, four. it wasn't five. Four years, four years I swear I can count. Was it count. three? Four. 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 four seasons. Four seasons. 2021, yeah. 2022. There we go. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Finger counting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but that's, yeah, four years, that, that's, that's not nothing. So that is yeah. an end of an era. So uh, I, I bet that must be a quite emotional uh, moment now, actually, for a lot of Paris Eternal fans, for a lot of uh, the players, maybe not the new additions, because they may or may not have been as attached to the name as some of the older ones. But yeah, still, that was the last showing for this season for the Paris Eternal. And we want to thank them so much for all the entertainment throughout all those days. All those hours we got to watch them play it out and i hope to see more of the newest additions uh, from that team as well maybe in the next season uh, but for now boston uprising still have a fighting chance and i'm going to be very interested to see how far they can take it uh, in uh, the play-ins which start next week for now though we're going to preview our next and the final the last match the regular season of the OHD wow. 2022, wow. Wow. which is crazy. And that one is going to be battled out between the Houston Outlaws and the Toronto Defiant. Now, Costa, you brave, brave, brave little man. <laughs> you did pick the Toronto Defiant. Um, you didn't want to defend it. I'm still going to make you, though, because we have a minute to fill. Uh, they're just a really long team, and I really, <laughs> I really respect that Aww. about them. You know, I really, yeah, I really sometimes feel, they just geez. do belong. What can I do? Just a really, you know, coming off of that, you know, third at their own home stand. I'm still into the Hopium a little bit. Houston Outlaws, as I said in the pre-show, maybe they're not putting their best foot forward. It, this match really has no implications on the rest of the season, while Toronto Defiant are going to be fighting for their lives next weekend okay. in this meta. So I think they have a lot more to play for. So I'm just hoping that that will get them across the line in this matchup. I actually heard that the reason that uh, Costa predicted Toronto Defiant was because back when we were in the Blizzard Arena, Dante cut in front of Costa in the catering line once. Did he really? Wow. I hate Dante. Well, <gasps> we're feuding. We're, it's, it's crazy right now. Yeah. Dude, you guys, you guys Dante, I, I, I will see you in Anaheim. Yeah, at, and he'll cut in front line. of the line. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he got a fast pass for that catering line. He better watch out. And now we are excited to get this last match on the road. And for all the action, we once more hand it over to Matt and Mitch. Thank you very much, Zoe. Yeah, it's been uh, a pretty amazing season so far. I think we had the first match of the season, Matt, so being able to top it yeah. off here uh, with the last one uh, feels pretty good. Thanks for joining us, of course, ladies and gentlemen, for two teams with uh, huge aspirations in the postseason. The Outlaws are already locked. Uh, they're in a pretty decent spot. They don't have to compete in the play-ins. The Defiant, um, you know, a team that we really thought was just going to completely exceed expectations when we saw them at their home event, have had a bit of a rockier time now through this countdown cup and as a result they'll be in the play-ins yeah and, and look i mean they have a very talented roster you think they have a good shot in the play-ins i think you probably talked to some of the people around toronto defy and they probably thought they were gonna be in that top six like locked one of those spots right they thought they acquired enough talent uh to probably break in there and i and i think on paper they did uh, i know uh hot by i think has been a great addition since he's like really taken over the tank roll right about it matt sure uh, never looked better i must say <laughs> the wind has changed on you <laughs> here we go here's your houston outlaws team now you know if you poke around the stats a little bit don't do it if you're a paris eternal fan but uh you know i had a little bit of a hoke around and pelican still holds the record for the highest amount of damage per 10 out of anybody with 500 minutes plus played so that's a big deal and he's going to look to continue to do that here in this kind of matchup we were really high on this team after what they were able to do to the dallas fuel at their home event 
again, there was a lot of intangibles at a, you know, surrounding a, a game like that. And, uh, you know, it definitely looks like the Outlaws were able to make the most of that environment and channel that ad adversarial nature into a victory. Creative uh, that swapped their Iris is, again, one of those trades that has ended up being you know, benefiting both squads. I think Creative has been a huge impact player. Lastro has had to uh, had the opportunity to be able to move over and play a bit more of that flex support. There's a good chance, though, that if the Outlaws are following suit with the rest of the teams in the Overwatch League, we're going to just go see him back towards that Lucio and allow Creative to pilot the Baptiste, although either player, uh, in theory, could really be a, a solid force on that particular pick. Merritt really impressed me. He blew my mind, honestly, uh, when we were over in Dallas for that particular matchup. Again, continue to show levels of consistency that maybe weren't expected from someone uh, really being shuttled into the Overwatch League as rapidly as he was, but he is working fantastically alongside Pelican. And Dante showing us that he moves out of the Zaya and just looks really, really good. Uh, statistically, both Dante and Hopper pretty even on the statistic uh, on the statistic numbers, right? So damage-wise, Dante has a slight lead in damage per 10. Final blows, Dante is 8.9 final blows per 10 on the Zaya, which is really significant. It's definitely on the higher end of the scale. I would say maybe less defensive, and you saw the kind of pressure he was able to put someone like Hanbin under, someone who was starting to use these panic grabs left, right, and center in that game uh, between Houston. Uh, and Dallas. Let's move across to the other side now and have a look at your Toronto Defiant, a team who again seem destined to try and maintain perfect balance in all things. And that extends to their win and loss record. Right now though, it's an odd week for them. They're 11 and 12. But this team again, a lot of players that can really start to take the game over. Finale, big impact players since coming in. It's a little interesting, I guess, that we don't see, uh, you know, although, when a lot of teams are trying to field Genji players finale, we knew generally as more of a tracer aficionado, but coming alongside Hisu here, he's looked very, very good being rotated back into this lineup. And not a whisper about Muse, since Hotbar has come in here and he's in the perfect meta to show his particular skill set, of course, and that is primarily that Zarya play. Chorong and Twilight, we've sung their praises on multiple occasions here. But again, like as it's sort of been talked about, I think, you know, Toronto are dealing with uh, yeah, some, some sickness at the moment. So a couple of their players still on the mend here, and that can definitely affect you when you're going into games like this. I think Scott pointed it out on the desk. Uh, no huge implications in terms of uh, the postseason. Matt, welcome back here. We're talking Toronto Defiant. <laughs> Talk about the Defiant so bad uh, that my, my entire computer just exploded here uh and you know now now i get the opportunity to but uh look if opportunity to get to 12 and 12 right uh that would be the definition of the desk kind of calls the mid i actually think the toronto define are better than that but that might just be me uh i i actually kind of like like this roster a lot that i think in the playoffs they're a pretty scary team uh but you know, in this matchup, I think for me, I don't, I don't know what you were saying because I was gone. Uh, What's the difference to when you're here? I'll uh, carry on. I mean, that's actually true, to be fair. Um, at, le at least I kind of listen to a little bit of what you say, like sometimes, like not a ton. Um, but I, I think it's a little bit of a toss up, right? Because it's like what the Outlaws, they've already kind of like secured their spot. Like Toronto, we know where they're going to be. Uh, you know, do you want to get 12 and 12? Just kind of say you did it uh, for the Outlaws. <laughs> like, you know, just trying to give yourself a little bit of momentum. Uh, <laughs> you said nothing of substance since you came back. <laughs> uh, I mean, what, what is going on with this match, though? I mean, you know, every match, listen, Mitch, every match matters, okay? Right? <laughs> this match matters because one team is going to get a win. <laughs> And another team is going to get a loss uh, off of this I one. I can't believe you're getting paid for this. <laughs> so, so there's going to be a team that's going to win this match, Mitch, and there's going to be a team that's going to lose it. All right. Oh, God. Oh, help. Okay. <laughs> yeah, look, they're trying to defy it. Like, you're right, though. They're looking forward to this matchup with the Washington Justice, who are kind of scary to go up against in the postseason, right? Teams don't like sort of picking them unless you're kind of Dallas and... Dallas regretted that decision pretty sorely, I think, over in Toronto um, you know, against that Justice squad. So both of these teams, what links them together is they both got absolutely wrecked by the Florida Mayhem this week. 3-1 uh, and 3-0 respectively here. So both teams are looking to bounce back. And well, again, like you mentioned, Matt, that's basically the, the, 
the extent of the implications uh, in this head-to-head. -head. I, I think Toronto has a little bit more, like, you know, players under the weather, right? Like, a little bit, you, you don't want to say, like, an excuse, right? But, like, a, a, a re more valid reason to lose to, like, the Florida Mayhem. Uh, also, the Florida Mayhem could just be playing really good. Uh, where the Outlaws, right? Like, this is a team that, you know, is at full strain, you know, operating in a meta that you, know, you think they could be successful at, right? With the players that they have. Um, where their loss is a little bit worse to me. Yeah, I feel that. Chorong uh, is having to find Barrett actually at the start of this round, right? A really exciting player to see move across from playing Lucio, where he was also really aggressive and there was a lot of skill expression in his play style. Hopper there, going to be desuited as he tries to get away from creative. Toronto start with point control on virtue of Merritt being out of the picture early in the round, but that looks to be uh, rectified pretty quickly. Uh, and are you surprised that they're not going to just play Hotba on the Zarya? Like, trying to play the Diva into the Zarya is so difficult. Uh, e even, like, now Zarya with, like, flankers kind of, like, can, can work, right? We see Zarya with Genji a ton, like, even with Tracers. So, uh, I... I'm not sure if I was Toronto, right, I would commit to this uh, D.Va play because when you get into the back line, they're going to have the Immortality Field, the boobs for Displacement, and then you're just going to get beamed down uh, with Dante getting all that charge off of Bubble and the support. So uh, I'd like to see them just kind of match in that Zarya mirror. Yeah, isn't that comp a little outdated? We were seeing this like a couple it, weeks yeah. ago, right? Team starting to move away from it. I think Finale actually buffered the potential knockback by dashing forward there, but Merritt's able to finish the job. Uh, Railgun made it so Finale would die yeah. to the disruptor shot. I'd also say if you are the Defiant, uh, there's less reason to like show what you possibly could play in the play-in rather than like, you know, the Outlaws. By the time they get to the playoffs, right? You know, you have uh, Kariko in the mix and whatnot. Like, the, you know, the compositions they're going to be playing are completely different, right? right. Uh, you know, when we go into the play-in, it's going to be the same exact patch. So do you want to show you know, your opponent in the play-in, like, what you're going to play or plan to play on these exact, you know, maps and whatnot? I especially when this match doesn't really impact your seeding at all, right? There's really no reason to commit to play that exact way. Big EMP here as Toronto hold on to a large number of those ults and Finale. Not able to finish the immortality field, but Hopper is going to be there to get the job done. Pelican forced away again by Chorong, who seems to really have his number. Keeping the Defiant in a position to accrue more of this capture percentage. And it'll be an even game before the Outlaws have a chance to touch here, but both teams, ton of ultimates. The Graviton Surge, obviously the threat of that is constantly looming. Dante lets it go here, it's not eaten up, and Finale's able to at least trade for creative, but the grab pays off, Dante for two. Yeah, it's going to be the Outlaws now making their way towards the points, trying to take it. I mean, do you try and contest this if you're a Toronto? You have the Transcendence. It would be a little bit of a throw there, but Hoppa's got the self-destruct. Oh, he's getting taken out right right as he's trying to get back in the mech. That's going to be the Transcendence here. Is that Chorong so just obnoxious. extending that? <laughs> just so obnoxious from Chorong there. Again, this, I guess, is an argument that that makes sense. You get an extra bit of percentage there by sat on the point for a bit longer, but that is a Transcendence. That There's an argument available. for everything. <laughs> well, that's true. Doesn't mean it's a good one. Fair point. Uh, I, I So I don't exactly hate it from the standpoint of like, oh, well, what are you saving the Transcendence for? We just saw Grav come out. You're at like 75% for both teams. Like, I, I think if Hisu was, uh, if, you know, Hisu would have gotten there and then Hoppa would have been alive, probably would have looked way better. But still, you get a, a few extra percentage points off of it. Yeah, again, that Dragon Blade is a looming threat, though, without that sound, uh, with the uh, Transcendence not in play. Chorong again, this time it's Dante. He gets nano boosted, as it looks like a lot of attention was going his way. Disrupt the shot makes it a little bit harder to peak here, and we're at 98%. Hopper's so low, almost too low to contest at all. It had to be he's to move up on the point and touch, and here's that aforementioned blade oh. deflected sleep back into Chorong. Yeah. That came from Twilight, Matt. Yeah, see, he just, you know, deflects it, puts Chorong to sleep, and then just leaves it as he gets back to the point. Is, you know, Merit's taking tons of damage, creative, trying to keep everybody alive. Going to use an Ant Matrix here to seal the deal. Chorong again gets creative. There's a Pulse Bomb here for Finale. Could be a big one if he can actually touch the point, but Lastro is keeping them at arm's length as much as humanly possible. He does get that Pulse away, but it doesn't even get around the door. So the Outlaws will take the round away. Toronto trying to stall their cap as long as they could, but... Didn't really have the tools to come back in and win a fight. Yes, Creative does a nice job, even though he gets taken out by Chorong, but the Ant Matrix and then to keep Merit and Pelican alive is, now Merit that's on the opposite side of the point, like putting down some damage, and Pelican's the one who's really stalling it out. Which 
holds it enough to get everybody back into the fight there towards the end, which you know, now we're going to see the Zarya Mir. I would have loved to have seen this in the previous map. I thought it would have been a much easier time there for the Defiant. Chorong uh, leads his team in final blows and damage done at the moment. Very much playing around that Zenyatta from the high ground, uh, the Defiant. Not enough to give him the round win, though. And he'll be on the Lucio this time. Makes a lot more sense. Far, far fewer safer spots for his end to play from now. And we know that Chorong just as deadly on the skates. Yeah, the only difference is the Tracer versus the Genji. Kind of like what we saw in the Paris Eternal series for a bit is uh, Hisu tries to get for the high ground. Merritt just lands a shot, just coming on the opposite side of him is uh, another nice rail shot there. Is, this is all outlaws thus far. Really can't ask for much more from Merritt there with that opener. Didn't have to be flashy, but getting rid of these defiant plays before they can even really set up is, is a big deal. And Houston now could push up a little bit further here and it lets Merritt play from the high ground if he wants. I think he's drops back to the point there. Maybe the concern of Finale wrapping around and causing some issues. Hisu will hunt for a recipient of that rail gun, but there's none to be found. Yeah, they're really giving him nothing, right? You see when he just jumps around the corner and pokes, it's like nobody there to even build charge off of as Pelican goes in deep and not able to survive, even with some Zarya bubble help. They're going to lose Dante because of that as well. Yeah, not very convincing stuff now from the Outlaws. Losing Pelican so early in that uh, immortality field comes down with only three plays left for the Outlaws. Creative not really able to stem the bleed. So Toronto get to, I mean, get back in the game maybe a little bit earlier than I expected after how one side yeah. the first fight was. And, and look at that, you know, hop on the Zarya. Kind of, kind of question why they didn't run it in the first round. Uh, no, 80% doing a nice job building up tons of charge off of those bubbles. Uh, like I mentioned, you know, Pelican, he got some bubbles to go in before, but they did a great job just beaming him down, focusing him down. Hoppa's a large source of that damage. Absolutely. Especially in the later stages of these fights, as he's given time to charge up and he's going to be healed. Big stick there. Immortality Field has to come into play, but Hisu, Pelican traded out, and Finale cannot get back up that hill. Lastro with an environmental kill. Now putting the Outlaws in a great position to go for the jugular. They'll flip the point. Sound barrier applied to three players. This now turns the fight around completely. Dante barely able to escape here. Hopper looking frightening. Late fight Zaya, just like we were foreshadowing there. And Astro has to boop him away from Dante to keep him up. Yes, uh, now they're going to work their way back towards the points. But Dante's got to build up some type of charge here as both bubbles just use the first and now long range grab there on a Hopper. Oh, that's pretty brilliant. Immortality Field is really going to be enough in situations like that. And Dante got that charge very, very quickly. Still, the points not flip, though. Toronto doing a good job against stalling, but this is just reminding me of the previous this round. This is round one. Yeah. Yeah. This is just kind of how round one went. I think the difference maker here, though, is like with Hotbun and the Zarya, you have like a clear win condition with like a Graviton Surge, right? Where there was really nothing. I guess Hisu's EMP uh, there in round one, but didn't really even see great use of that, where now Houston, you think, possibly can rattle off a few fights in their favor, right? Blade with no beat on the other side. Uh, and then Merritt has been so good in the Sojourn all season, one of the better ones in the league. Uh, I think able to hit at least a shot with that overclock. Hisu now has a chance to try and show up his opposite number. Fair bit of that went to giving Dante some extra charge. Merritt's doing the same with his ultimate. Here's a blade from Pelican. Gets himself an audience with Twilight, the king. And takes him down with the help of Dante. Immortality field removed very quickly. And Pelican wants more, as he often does. This man wants the world. He's here to take it. So, uh, even if the blade doesn't get, like, one kill, right? It gets the immortality field out and then also allows Dante to build up enough charge to push forward and take out Twilight as... And you know, look at that, with just the overclock and the blade, how everything is shifted now in favor of the outlaws. Both teams have these amp matrices to work with. I don't love it for Toronto, though. Needs to be another big finale pulse bomb on someone who can't be thrown under an immortality field. He's taken down by Creative. The amp matrix went up pretty quick. Too fast for finale to respond to. And there's no turning back time now for the Tracer player. On to the point goes hot by the immortality field. Sheepishly deployed, but it's far too little, far too late. And the Outlaws end up with a pretty convincing map one showing. Taking Ilios. Yeah, as, uh, I wonder what the rest of the series kind of has in store for us. If Toronto is going to experiment with some more uh, compositions, whether it be with the, the D.Va in the mix, with the Sombra, or if we're going to see more of this 
Now, kind of what's become standard, this Zarya matchup with the Sojourns in play. Yeah, a rough start here for the Detrona Defiant, looking a little green around the gills, but Houston relying on the pretty standard superstar names to propel them forward. Dante looking great, and Pelican with eight final blows over that particular map, helping take his team to victory. Good start for Houston now, as they want to make a big statement, as they're going to take some time off before the playoffs. Please don't let me in my zone. I just need some time on my own. All these people trying to get a conversation. You can conversate to that tone. Uh, my gut eyes on that throne, yeah. So I'm never alone, yeah. All these people trying to box me in. I'm in my weather. It's on, yeah. Now they ask where I'm at. Making his that line back. I'm MJ. I'm 2-3, man. I just need some time back. I'm zoned in like defense. My life gone, no recess. But I live my best one, so I got no regrets. So go, I'm gone. Find me back in my home. I'm working like so much. They swear I had me a clown. Little sluggish of a start there for the Toronto Defiance.
come out of the gates looking a little lackluster on uh, Elios, but that is to say that the Outlaws look well and truly recovered from their, I would say, upset loss earlier this week after really setting the bar high with a win against the field in front of that home crowd. So Outlaws still just want to cement this idea of them being a true threat come playoffs. Yeah, they're, uh, they're round one comp, Toronto Defiant, look frozen in time like I was, uh, you know, in the, in the lead up. I, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't realize that was fully that just, just, uh, uh, just emotionless at screen there. I thought, uh, I thought maybe there was like you know, some signs of life, but nah, mate. I guess not. Nah. It was quiet for them. I think, look, uh, as I saw a couple <laughs> moments where like Finale's able to put some decent pressure down on the tracer. We've already talked about why some teams are, you know, angling away from their tracer. And that's why I said in the pregame that maybe I was expecting to see Aldo actually get start to get folded back into some of these compositions, right? Oh, they that's what you talked about. Pressure. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. What do you think about that? Big um, shot. Makes a little bit of sense. Uh, Possibly. I mean, we don't know, right? Like, you know, players under the weather for the Toronto Defiant, like maybe they would do that, but we just don't really know. Because we saw, though, a lot during the Summer Showdown, right? Uh, he's yeah. pretty much like a mainstay uh, for that team. But Genji was also like a mainstay where I think now a little bit more flexibility required uh, to play things other than the Genji, but it's possible. I, I truly don't believe like what we saw in round one. Uh, of that Ilios is like what we would see this team play moving forward. I think kind of seeing them on that Sojourn, Genji, Zarya, this type of composition is probably what they're going to be pulling out, you know, in play-ins. Right. Okay. He's just still rocking the Philly Fusion, by the way. Yeah. It's yeah. Been a, it's been a bit. They were, they were again, they were preparing him for Princeton on, uh, on that kind of team. But Toronto sort of realized the potential. He's also a mode to see around the corner here, which is fair. Wants to make sure he has info before he peeks. Fortune doesn't get anything out of it. Tracer used to be able to emote to hide herself in a wall. That was funny. He wanted to show that one off. Uh, so a few players used to... Oh, oh don't! Uh, Sorry, Lastro. Yeah, okay. you saw him trying to get away with the speed, but it was uh, not good enough. As you see, everybody in the Outlaws just back up. They're going to probably give up at least two ticks here and then try and recontest. I love that though. Great uh, awareness from Hotba and Chorong both. Recognize there's a pick to be had. Dante pretty charged up as he moves out of the... Really? <laughs> you, really? All right. <laughs> Don't know how that's possible considering he was on his way back to the point, but Creative is able to stand up on his own two feet and get the kill on Finale. The Outlaws are able to come back in, but you were right, Matt. They gave up two ticks and change. Yeah, yeah they gave up two ticks. They get right back at it. So oh, Tech is... Finale, uh, okay, uh, uh, is, did he just switch to this to, okay, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, there's no way he's just going to come out now and play the Widowmaker. Uh, it looked like he was just trying to maybe get, like, a pick on the point as some of the players were still fighting there for the Defiant. So, goes back to the Genji. Give up some old charge uh, for that, uh, but I guess that's okay uh, if you view that from the Toronto Defiant POV. Uh, so Lastro just, uh, you got to be able to keep him alive. I mean, my brother in Christ, what is happening? <laughs> The they sheer aggression. Yeah, they never swap sides here. <laughs> All right, yeah, Lastro goes forward again. He's definitely suffering some attention, but able to be kept topped up by Creative. And Lastro here, yeah, straight into that immortality field. He's concerned that Creative gets dove on there. The Outlaws now look far more uh, adroit than they did in the last couple fights. I'll say that for free. So two minutes on the clock uh, with all these ultimates coming online. No, you're right. I think you're really looking at like one really good fight here probably left for the Toronto Defiant. I mean, 60% towards a blade. You're not really close at all to the overclock. Uh, as you're working against the clock, you really got like one, maybe two really good attempts at this. I think this one coming up though, you know, you end up using your grab. It's probably the best one. Immortality too late. Now they get dropped down and he's just able to punch run through Dante before. The Outlaws have a chance to keep him up. Yeah, do you beat and try and fight the city of the Outlaws? They have yes. Matrix. I see. Uh, but again, it's that's still a little late. Lastro only really just got that, though, so fair enough. Merit's able to come back, though, with the overclock. Can he make the difference here? So much pressure being applied to Hotbar. And Pelican's Blade going to be the difference maker. That's huge. Getting Twilight as well. Finale trying to make the play here. Pelican avoiding the Genji as much as he humanly can. He's so low, and he gets burnt down by Dante, who is the sole survivor. 
As the smoke clears, he stands among the wreckage and creators back to top him up. The grab late to get Hisu. That's just mental. I was gonna say, do you really need that? But I guess with how well, you're uh, below a minute, right? You don't want anything crazy to happen. You know other players coming off the spawn for the Defiant. As Twilight now over the Ana here. So not even gonna be running the, the BAP, which is, I mean, BAP is so important in these types of comps with that regenerative burst in the immortality field. Uh, maybe you're looking at a big bio, trying to sleep somebody. Uh, I, I feel like not having the Batiste here is going to be really hard. Not a lot of hide burst it. healing. I uh, just yeah. hate it. Yeah. Doesn't matter though. Fortunately, Hisu's able to make his own luck. Merit slides on through like he's on cool runnings. Hisu absolutely smashed. And the Outlaws looks like they're going to be able to hold up under this kind of heat. Merit exploding onto the scene in these last couple of fights. Combine that with Pelicans, dangerous, but uh, effective Dragon Blade. And here you have a Houston Outlaws team that are going to take it to overtime. Still a chance for Toronto to touch, but this will be their last, last attempt. Yeah, Finale trying to go up high and try and get a touch as he'll get pushed back, but he'll at least trigger OT. It's going to allow Dante to get back in the fight here again for the Outlaws. And Pelican's just licking his lips, seeing the Ana come back here. Biota Grenade did come down, there was no chance for an Immortality Field. That was really the only good answer if Twilight can find a good nade there. Getting Chorong is fine. Hard to really do too much more with what you're left working with on the Outlaw squad. Hopper doesn't have any mortality field, but just doesn't need it. He runs over Dante. And the Defiant get to play the game. <laughs> In the final seconds, they're able to take it. I mean, that is not a uh, a clean take there. So the Biotic Grenade's pretty big, though, right? It goes right into where that Am Matrix is down. You're able to pick up a kill or two off of the back of it. Uh, so the Ana paying off at the end there for the Defiance, but that is uh, too close for comfort, for sure. Toronto build into some key ultimates though, and they stay on this Ana pick. I guess we have a chance to talk about it more. At least there is a very good nano candidate in Finale and Hotbar respectively. And again, if you hit that body grenade, it basically says Houston have to use an immortality field. Here's that grab. Yeah, nothing you can do there, right? They don't even need the nano, so you now end up winning the fight off of the back of that grab. No need for the nano. You have a nano blade here coming up, which is so powerful, uh, regardless of Watch 1 or Watch 2. Uh, you're going to have to use just about everything for the Outlaws if you're looking to hold here for point B, so Toronto making up a ton of time. And yeah, we'll see Sound Barrier. May not in and of itself be enough. Dante might be looking to try and grab Finale, knowing that Nanoblade is now potentially on the menu. Either that, or try and blow Hotbar up immediately. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not surprised at all to see him try and take the initiative here. Finale Nano holds the blade until some of that sound barrier has expired, and here it is, man. It's just filthy. Gets rid of that emo field. Two players down on the Outlaws, and yeah, they're not able to stop the Defiant. He was snowballing, and his honor is a big part of that. Yeah, it's, you know, I I didn't really love the honor play uh, or decision at the start, right? Because the immortality field's so impactful and just the the healing from the Batiste, but getting good value out of the Nano, really getting good value out of the Biotic Grenades, right? No, like, uh, Diva Defense Matrix seated up, like, you, know, you can bubble some of it off, but that's just forcing out the bubbles, which is still good if you're uh, the Defiant. So, Yana really paying off as uh, as we say that. Merit just hits a long range shot, just insta kills Twilight. Is that going to be a, an overclock here? Okay. Yeah, maybe a little just too much the there. push. They didn't want to get to keep down. the yeah. pressure on. Yeah, I suppose that's fine. Pelican has a blade here. What can he do with it? Straight on in, finds Hisu. The revenge kill comes up and Chorong falls soon after. There's no way Twilight was going to avoid that unless there was a sleep dart available. So the push does get stopped eventually. Yeah, and I think that's probably why you use the overclock because if you are in the position of the Defined, if you lose like one or two to Merit's overclock, if you don't like you know, have just the threat of the insta kill coming on in, they probably push up to this spot right here. Now you get bullied all the way back to your spawn uh, and you're fighting at a way worse position. Dante wants to control this space here and also make it scary if Finale dashes into his team. But there's a grab waiting here. Immortality Field looks like it's almost enough until Finale starts to slice and dice. And off go the Defiant once more, but we're under a minute left and a lot of this is a result of how long it took them to get started on first. But hey, just the prospect of being able to finish the map, uh, that being in play is quite impressive. Yeah, they made up a ton of time after that, right? And now you have the opportunity for a Nanoblade here at the end. Dante's probably going to have to grab that. 
Uh, but very close to getting the payload on home. Nano for Hopper here, even though Finale's oh, close wow. to the blade. Interesting priorities there. Here's the crab. Dante shuts Hopper down. But still a good fight for the Defiant. His air matrix forces Finale though into a defensive posture. And Dante's able to punish him after the fact. Here he pushes. We disrupt the shot on the point. Creative should be able to keep Dante healthy. So Toronto have one chance to have what may resemble a fight. But it'll be scrappy at best. And you just see how strong the bat is there with Dante, who's got the bubbles, but being able to keep the Zarya alive, the immortality field that ultimately allows the Outlaws to hold on and prevent the Defiant from completing the map. So, pr pretty good offense after point eight from the Defiant. Uh, g given kind of the time constraints they were dealing with, uh, really good offense through point B. Uh, and then there at the end, really, they just have one great shot at it. I'm surprised they didn't save the Nano for the Blade. Uh, like, kind of like let them out of the door a little bit and then go with the Nano Blade because Hoppa, uh, you know, still would have been pretty charged up, pretty healthy there, right? So, uh, may have been a decision. Could have thought about I think they're worried he. I think they're worried that he dies, potentially. Um, right. Losing him at the start of that Playing fight. Playing that far up. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting given how Finale just cut through all the defensive resources, right, when he got that Nano Blade and. That's kind of what that combo is designed to do. You don't invest two ultimates without expecting it to be able to ignore, you know, sound barriers and immortality fields and the like. Toronto, I, you know, I still honestly think they'd be disappointed with that result. Uh, they made up so much yeah. time in that second part of the map that really the, the prospect of being able to complete the map, get three checkpoints, starts to materialize there and as their expectations shift. So I'd be a little bit annoyed here and, you know, it never feels good on King's Row uh, being the kind of map where you sort of can't, can't finish the map. So... See what the Outlaws do here. This, the first couple of fights are really important. Uh, what a point out, obviously, that the Defiant, you know, they go back to the Baptiste here on defense. That immortality field is just so, so, so powerful. It really helps Hotbar uh, hang around far longer than he otherwise should and get value out of that charge, where sometimes he might just get blown up at 100 charge. Yeah, the honor seemed to be like a last second, uh, last ditch effort there from Toronto, because like their, their offense was pretty much spiraling out of control. And then once they kind of took it, that you're close to that nano, you just kept on rolling with it. But the BAP is definitely the more preferred method amongst both teams. As the Outlaws, they just speed boost right onto the point. They're going to try and bait the Defiant down into fighting them. He's who cops that one there. He's very, very low, and there's a lot of pressure on Twilight to keep the Defiant standing here. As Pelican hides behind the TARDIS for a brief moment. Good bubble time from Hotbar. That makes Pelican a little bit afraid here. And Toronto able to bully the Outlaws back away from their checkpoint. Yeah, you kind of saw that one coming, right? When Creative had to use the Immortality Field. Pelican and Dante both basically dead at that point and not able to, like, heal them back up. So once you lose Dante, it's just nothing you can do there, especially with Hoppa alive, as you see how much extra damage Hoppa gets towards the end. Fifty-six on that bubble, uh, that grab charge. Oh dear! Early pick, never a good sign. Not on someone like Finale, who's such a good recipient of Zaya bubbles, could also drop down and contest the point with that aforementioned assistance from his tank. And Pelican just goes upstairs, gives Hisu the old double slap. Yes, you see, I mean, when he goes right into the high ground, Pelican, he's got a bubble just going right at Hisu's face. There's nothing you can really do about it, because what? You shoot the bubble, you're not going to do any damage to Pelican. You deplete your ammo, and you give Dante charge. You kind of just have to, like, live through it or attempt to live through it. Uh, and at that point, Twilight's, like, rotating around trying to get an Amp Matrix drop. So, end up losing Hisu, and, yeah, it's just a really tough spot. So, just two pushes there on offense for the Outlaws for them to be able to take checkpoint A. They're also, because of you know, how late some of these kills came in and how close they were to taking it, they're going to gain a little bit of progress here. Uh, to a point where, you know, you're looking at maybe, like, this streets area is, like, one, two fights at the most. Yeah, not that fun for Toronto if they don't get the chance to play the choke yeah. here at least a little bit. And the Outlaws are already about two minutes ahead. Uh, you use the threat of an amp matrix here to just push them back. Yeah, I mean, look at this. Oh, not even the threat. Sometimes you got to deliver on those threats, otherwise they're empty. As his, uh, <laughs> hop his veins, Merritt just blows it him up. It's not even though, like, you notice they drop the M Matrix and everybody just runs past it. Like, because they know that Toronto is just going to try and speed boost out, right? So it just buys them all of that space there to be able to just push them back. You know, pretty much to the choke right before that second checkpoint is, uh, see our golden box of victory. They don't have to complete the map. Got to get damn close, though. Yeah, a couple grabs here, plus the blades and the sound barriers. So expect to see them laid out in sequence. 
It's really going to come down to judgment of the Genji players, where they can find the most value here. And I love starting the fight off with this ability here. Hoppart tries to grab Dante, who spends much of that time sunning himself uh, underneath the immortality field. But it's going to be Dante to full first, as he's just able to find the overclock. And employs it very effectively here. Important stop for Toronto, and there need to be a couple more of those here. Yeah, as both teams end up holding onto their blades throughout all of that. I think also Twilight with that Amp Matrix, he'll be able to use that in the same type of fashion we talked about when Creative had it, right? Use it to, you know, maybe force the Outlaws to just push back. Could you drop it when they use the blade to maybe try and split the team, right? Some players want to actually go in past that. Some want to just try and back up. So we see from the Toronto POV, the overhead map. Looks like they're going to try and play in that back right corner. We're looking at now with that Amp Matrix. Frontline's trading blows here. Finale dash in, find Blade. Immortality field, he, he's ready for it. He actually gets to take a pit stop here and get a mega health pack. Unfortunately, it's too long out of the fight. So he needs to put that one away and watch Hisu fall and not be able to do too much about it. Finale still though getting involved. Swift strike, get some value. And again, he's going to be very, very careful. It's a dangerous game for these Genjis and Dante still charged up after beating Hoppa down. And this will be a checkpoint now once Chorong is extracted from the situation. Yeah, as Pelican goes to the trace, you probably just get back, so we'll see him go back to the Genji here for the last part of the map. Though you, you could run Tracer, but I think the Genji here is better for just kind of access that high ground. Yeah, so we're going to switch back. So now for the Outlaws, they can kind of do the same thing, Mitch, right? Drop that Ant Matrix, push them back a little bit, you know, bully them, maybe they'll pick up one kill, and then that would just allow you to just keep moving that car without stoppage, which is pretty much towards the end. Yeah, this is the scenario that Toronto really wanted to avoid. Having Houston come into the last phase of the map with more than three minutes of time, sometimes you, all you need to do is wait until the tides or the, you know, go your way in terms of that ultimate economy. And you can just win a very mathematical fight. Copper's grab here. I like the idea of trying to be proactive with this. And yeah, straight into the back line. And look at how he catches. Dante, who can body block a lot of this. And he's not able to get in Hopper's way. He just snaps up Lassar on Pelican for for that grab and lovely looks here for Toronto. Being proactive is going to be a huge part of their game plan and stopping the Outlaws in their tracks here. You notice we have Twilight back on the Ana. So going back to the Ana, trying to get good value out of those big biotic grenades with their, uh, they're thrown at the grab, the Ant Matrixes, uh, and then potentially trying to get like a sleep on the Pelican, right? When he goes in with that blade, which you know, eventually you're going to get. It's all, that's going to be an early grab. They did not expect that. Sound barrier though, good timing from Chorong. Lastro had his held over from the previous fight though. So here come the Outlaws. Want to get some value out of that extra durability here, but they run headlong into Finale's Blade. Immortality Field though, good to buy some time, good to buy Merit some space, but Hopper sends a, a right click over at him. This is perfect for Toronto. They've actually been able to weather the storm now of the Outlaws getting that grab and that sound barrier off. They come out on top. They're winning in fights with their short hand at all economy-wise, and now he's who gets to hold over this overclock. I, I think this will be a scary fight, though. Uh, no sound barrier, uh, no grab to be able to stop this blade that's going to come through from Pelican. Yeah, you're really looking at what, like, and kind of like a bit of an old school type of what solve, where Twilight's going to hit like a big sleep dart, but they're able to use these bubbles on the Pelican, so it's not going to be that easy. Yeah, Hisu pops this as soon as he's certain that the Outlaws are committing. Unfortunately, he's actually incorrect in that estimation. Houston are able to disengage, and now here comes the Blade and the Bubble. Pelican looking to push up here, but Merrick catches Hotbar before he can get the grab away. It doesn't matter, though, because posthumously, he's able to set up the rest of the Defiant to get such key kills. Toronto win another fight in a row, and the Outlaws are down to a minute. Yes, uh, this Han has really thrown things off. For the Outlaws, is Twilight, when they switch over to that hero, we, I mean, we've known him as just an insane Ana for years, but this is one where we haven't seen a ton of Ana in these compositions, where making a huge impact. That's going to be an Ant Matrix. Look at this. Just forces them out back into this corner. And Dante's going to go. He knows if he gets a kill here, the grab could be massive. Too deep. Goes too far. Grab at least gets Hughes and thought it caught Twilight there as he tries to run back to his spawn. But the Outlaws have to get this done without Dante, and that is a tall order. Finale has deflected up at just the right time, so Merritt has to be patient here. Then a Zarya bubble comes in. So hard to work this Genji down, and Twilight has a grab, and there's a sound barrier now up for Chorong. The tides are turning against the Outlaws as the Defiant hold their ground. Oh, man. A double support ult here for the Defiant here towards the end. Finale also going to probably end up getting a blade. Dante goes to Doom, then goes back to Zarya. 
So who's going to get a touch here? Is it going to be Pelican? Hodba absolutely beaming right now. When yep, Pelican gets caught in the crosshairs. Is there anyone to touch? No, Twilight's here no. just to make sure that's not even an option. Great defense from Toronto in the last part of the map. The old cycling, sublime. I don't know how much the Ana pick really f sort of uh, factors into that. But when Toronto knew they had an ult advantage, or at least an ult that could be effective to, to get a quick player advantage, they just used it straight away. Huge fan of how Hopper controls the front line in this head in this head-to-head, -head, man. He is elite at desire. I, I do think the Yana was definitely impactful, whether it be the nano boost to keep Hotbar alive or with the finale blade, and then really those biotic grenades. You know, really impactful. No way for the outlaws to dodge those, and they want to get value with that amp matrix. Series is tied here at one apiece as the Defiant seem to have shaken themselves from their stupor, and now they're ready to play. Don't go too far, everybody. It's map three next on the docket.
Well, just maybe this is what a literal champion will give you. Twilight switches over to the Arna on that King's Row map and has immediate and meteoric impact. Uh, pretty insane healing over over the course of him playing that, but again, 10 biotic grenade kills set up there, which is uh, which is pretty ridiculous. It's under 10 minutes of play there, so <laughs> yeah, uh, that's insane. Yeah, I mean, every time they would drop that air matrix, he would just fire a biotic grenade in there and connect with two, three players. And yeah, you see the impact of it, right? Forces them. How is, uh, much you want to use that air matrix, right, to force the other team out of position, though you kind of have an idea of where everybody's going to focus around, Group up. right? They want to, yeah, yeah, they want to, they want to be around there to kind of get value out of it, and just landing those big, easy biotic grenades. Uh, now, is that something you can play every single map? Uh, is it something a lot of other teams can play? Probably not. Uh, but Twilight just such a sick Ana player. Yeah, again, you know, during the sort of the, the Brigitte uh, meta, obviously, around Junker Queen's rise, uh, Twilight has less opportunities to, you know, engage in this form of skill expression. But between the Baptiste, obviously, if he can ever get his hands on the Zen, normally Chorong is taking the spotlight on that, but his Ana is still absolutely incredible. It's top flight. And it really shows there as Hotbar also has a fantastic map on the Zaya. 22 final blows, 10 deaths, leads his team in uh, in that former metric and helps Toronto get over the line as the Outlaws look like they were going to just ruin Toronto early. But this is kind of what I, like, when we talk about this defiant team, I feel like everybody is so split on them or kind of feels one way or another. Like, uh, so their lo some of their losses have been kind of like, you know, head scratchers, like, wait, what? But... They have beaten a lot of good teams throughout the season. So it's like, although they may finish like 12 and 12, like how many of those wins are like, which you kind of categorize as like really like high quality wins, right? Um, right? Well, they, they 3-0 Houston at their own uh, yeah. tournament. That was a pretty sick win. I mean, they may be better, I think, or uh, slightly better than kind of what people expect. Uh, it just seems like a team that everybody is just so split on. Yeah. You know how they're split? 50% on one side, 50% on the other, Matt. So we're going to see Zarya down there on the ground with the Brig up there on the high ground to protect, I guess, like Twilight and Hisu here, potentially. Uh, don't really need the speed on defense. And you're kind of like, well, Zen's an incredibly easy dive target. Uh, you still also need some type of, like, support sustain ultimate. So. If you're not going to play the Lucio, you're going to need either the Zen or the Brick, so you opt to go with the Brick here. Well, it's an emphasis of high ground control, I think, right? I just don't feel like yeah. the Defiant want to allow Houston to get up there at all. Uh, and the Brick just really tries to, really punctuates that point. Zen is still scary to dive in many ways, uh, especially with yeah. how that kick has been supercharged. But I think Toronto want to say, no, no, like, you, don't, you don't get to send Pelican up here. You don't get to establish a foothold at all. We'll make sure that we can constantly abuse this positional advantage to make it hard for you to push up here. So now you also have Finale on the Tracer, so not going to up for the Genji either. So much different look here from the Toronto to find this. Our recall doesn't put him on the roof. Got to be really careful here. here go. Little frustrating. He saw Merit use his slide and thought that was his opening. Fortunately, he doesn't quite get close enough to get the job done there. And Dante is not able to force his way through into that right side room. The Defiant again, really clutching onto this high ground, jealously. And when Pelican stands here and tries to deflect and get out, it doesn't really matter because he's got the brig swinging on him, right? So uh, you get into that room uh, with uh, Chorong, uh, Hotba, in Twilight. Very difficult. So uh, Chorong calls for a pause here. Uh, we'll figure out what's going on, but kind of state of the game at the moment. 2.30 on the clock. Defiant, they're going to have some ultimates coming up here soon. Hot, but way ahead. Uh, you know, I think probably obviously be able to gain more charge in, have high ground advantage than Dante there. Uh, so see how Toronto decides to use this. They're in a good position, though, to really uh, deplete some time from the Outlaws, though. Yeah, broadly, uh, not a great start for Houston, right? You saw them put in an awkward position of, you know, trying to push the cart up there, but having no real safe way to go upstairs, have high ground and actually contest that properly. Uh, that head-to-head that -head fight is much less desirable when Chorong is providing a lot of proximity healing and also threatening damage that's super hard to mitigate and also uh, can be applied in an area of effect arc. Finale might be uh, dropping something off of the pool here. As uh, he looks to try and stick that on the Zaya. 
Dante might have taken the hit there. Is he down to half? Immortality field deployed. Graviton surge, sound barrier for the outlaws here as they try and deal with the pressure. Hop has put them under. And Chorong has a rally. The Tafayan are again ready to stand and engage. Is the, is the rally strong enough though? It you might know, it be like, actually. Yeah, I mean, it looks like now towards the end it is, but man, uh, does it does it take a bit to just kind of get rolling? Where you still actually end up losing a few players there towards the beginning of the rally, but. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, it's good enough to keep Hotbot and Hisu alive, which at that point are your primary targets. Uh, you don't have it for this Pelican Blade. Although you really think like how great would have been against that blade is, oh, that's going to be the speed. Not going to have that coming on in. So it'll be the Outlaws. They'll back on up. Just going to be more time that Toronto burns off this clock. Grab here for Houston as well. Just getting in a good position to to fire that off is hard. You have to force the Defiant down into the choke, and in order to do so, you need to approach the card and have five players alive. And as we just saw, that's actually quite difficult to do here. I like this route. Yeah, this is definitely the answer. You're breaking line of sight for most of your approach, and they burst Hotspur down. Pulse Bomb, though. No. Oh, that catches Dante. Okay, it's a train of Zayus here, and Pelican goes down before he has a chance to use that Dragon Blade, Matt. Oh, is that now? now you're going to have to back up. I don't think you can fight this. As Man, that is a blown opportunity there as you had that grab in play. 40 seconds on the clock. I, I tell you what, if this blade's not massive. You had a really good chance of getting a hold here from the Defiant, which would be a huge momentum changer in this match. Jeez. That's what Outlaws were about to inflict on Toronto in the previous map. Definitely feels like a, a turning of tables has occurred. Merritt wants to wrap around, immediately goes for the overclock here. He has to strike goal. Or Crania, either one. Hopper extremely low, but able to get close to a grab again. That would be so big. That if I'm able to disengage from that ultimate, still the Pelican Blade in the mix. He's gonna go for it. Hopper might have his grab just in time as he blocks this. Does he fire it off? Yes, but he is still going to be felled in the meantime. Finale, though, finds two, and there's Twilight and Hisu. They get the job done. The Outlaws, so many big ultimates. They bring one at a time into that fight. And now we have a one versus one. Pelican v Finale goes for the deflect. It's not available. There's a pulse bomb on the horizon. Finale's forced to use that recall, but his opponent is so low. Pelican dodges away from the pulse. Another deflect, Finale. He goes down. Finale with three <laughs> HP. He wins the 1v1. And the Defiant shut the door oh, in the Outlaws' man. face. Dude, he wins that 1v1 a little bit earlier, uh, Pelican, and he actually gets that card across the line. But I tell you what, though, uh, the, the grab from Hotba, it's like a desperation grab, but he connects with a few players, and they're within line of sight of that Ant Matrix they have in that back corner, uh, which is just uh let's chuck everything at it and see what happens type of play is Toronto gets a hold. Man, that is huge for the Defiant. Oh, man. Down to the wire. A true 1v1. At, I think less than 10 health for both players. Desperation showing. But Finale able to hold on. Reinforcements arrive in, in, in form of the Wrecking Ball, apparently. But that is enough for a monumental hold here against the Houston Outlaws. And like we said, we question, okay, what's the brick for here? Chorong making a switch. And you didn't see how hard it is for the Outlaws to get a grasp on any of that high ground. You know, they group up, they're eventually able to get the cart far enough into the choke that they can, you know, take the uh, sneakier way through, but they lose so many minutes just trying to approach. Really impressive. Uh, small adaptation from Toronto there, Matt. Yeah, so what do you, so the Outlaws actually, Mitch, they'll come out here with Dante on the Diva, and then they're gonna have Lash on the Zen, so they wanna actually play a little bit more aggressive here on this high ground. Uh, but if the Defiant can, one, either speed and just kind of like force fights, right? Uh, or just play cart and force them to actually have to come down and fight that. That's where I think the Defiant's going to have a big advantage in terms of the comp matchup. All right. Can't stop any of this damage. But he doesn't want to get ahead of himself. And he wants to make sure he's ready to peel back in case Dante goes aggressive. Slow and steady here. Finale losing out on the card. He'll need to go back to spawn potentially to get his health in order. And Hopper just trying to make sure he's not caught in the open with no bubbles. Yeah, but look at Dante. I mean, what does he do? He has to back up to the rest of the team, and it's just hot by getting charged up, just pushing them slowly back. So eventually, I feel like this comp is just going to break here from the Outlaws, right? Yep. Or bend uh, enough that the card just gets through this choke and the Defiant get what they want either way, right? 
They don't get it out at the end of a, a winning fight per se, but look at them now. They've been able to slowly scale up their control of the map. Now allowing Hopper to wrap around, try and put Dante back to the wall here. Finale and Pelican working out the grudge that was fermented in that previous 1v1. But Lastro has gone down early here, not a great sign. Dante trying to close the gap on Hisu when he gets there. Hotbar has that bubble, but Dante is healthy enough just to dive and say, damage be damned, I'm gonna get in your face and try and find the Elim. Yes, he gets the nano boost then. The Diva, one of, if not, I, I mean, my opinion, the best duelist in the game right now, regardless of role, uh, with the nano able to take out Hisu and then push up, but... This Pelican is getting low, yeah, this, <laughs> oh yeah they're, they're gonna come back and try and fight this. Like, there's gonna be no delays. He's just gonna have high ground, you're probably gonna have some cart pressure, yeah, you're gonna get him moving a little bit. Look at this, I mean, Hoppa off spawn, he's gonna have that grab, you're gonna have an amp matrix to shoot into. Creative on the Ana. Pretty famous pick for him. Transcendence forced it, maybe a little bit prematurely there, as Hoppa is threatening. But despite that, I don't think there's much that the Defiant can do about it, even with that amplification matrix in play. So, a bit of 47, back to yeah, the drawing they, board. Hisu, another big pick. It, I was going to say, they end up just giving it up, but Hisu finds the last show again. As Chorong has the speed, so you're going to have... Yeah, look, he's going back, he's getting Twilight, who's now back over to Ana, and going to get Hop in the in the fight. So, what I think you're probably going to see is they're trying to set up that big grab with that Biotic Grenade in play. Finish off this map. Slow and steady for the Defiant. That's why they give up that earlier fight. They know they can come back and have the upper hand fundamentally. Gravel catch Lastro. Nowhere to go for the Zen here. He's caught around the corner and the rest of his team had to look on in dismay. Dante valiantly tries to keep his team alive in this one. Good juking, but it's not enough against five hungry, hungry Toronto players. And there it is. The Defiant take the lead in this series. Convincing would be putting it lightly on Dorado. Yeah, fantastic play there from the Defiant. Uh, really dominant on defense and then you know, just playing the smart game on offense, right? You know, Hoppa getting deep into the back line. No opportunity for Dante to eat that grab. And they take a 2-1 lead. Great showing from Toronto, showing good patience and uh, you know, a great little spin-off on the defensive setup for the high ground of Dorado, playing to their strengths and to the map's natural advantages. Houston now starting to look like they're flagging a little bit. A second wind had better be forthcoming, otherwise they're going to find themselves on the receiving end of an L. Stick around, everybody. More from your last Overwatch League regular season match after this.
Don't miss the ultimate celebration of the Overwatch League's fifth season. Come see your heroes rise at Grand Finals. Tickets available for November 3rd and 4th, so get yours before they go at overwatchleague.com forward slash 2022 forward slash playoffs. Again, to remind you, this is our final regular season match. We have our play-ins, of course, next week, and then we're headfirst into playoffs, November 3rd and 4th, rapidly approaching. Oh, yeah, I mean, just just get right to the good stuff after this, right? Uh, you know, the, the playoffs are always the best time. Uh, throughout the entire year. Uh, finals is going to be hype, right? Uh, I know having uh, all of those teams come to Anaheim uh, for the entire week, then us going into the arena, it's going to be it's going to be a sick time. Absolutely. That's really going to be a, a very suitable location for the culmination of a really exciting season of the Overwatch League, moving to Overwatch 2 and all the changes that has brought, the rise and fall of so many rosters over the course of this year, and then some that have been Oh, so perfectly balanced. The Toronto Defiant, again, are chasing that 12th win of the season to be 12 and 12. Now, I have bad news for those of you who uh, enjoy symmetry. Uh, they cannot uh -oh. get to a they cannot get to a zero map differential, uh, even with a win. They would be minus one at best if this is a 3-0 series. So, just want to set your expectations now, so you don't join me in freaking out. But really strong showing on Dorado, absolutely impervious on defense. And they turned it around with a pretty uh, sort of calculated, well-paced attack here now, moving, of course, over to a map that has had some pretty crazy Outlaws moments in the past. It is, of course, going to be Coliseo. Yeah, as, uh, you know, see what happens here at the start. We've seen a lot of just kind of like stalls here on uh, Coliseo, depending on what comps each team want to play. Uh, I think you see that really when the Hanzos come out uh, for either teams, where the Outlaws don't expect them to play anything different than what we've seen thus far. Uh, the Defiant, we've seen some Ana play, we've seen some Genji, we've seen some Tracer. Uh, Hotba after just kind of like a little bit of an early stint on the D.Va with the Sombra in the mix, uh, has gone over exclusively to the Zarya. So, uh, see, yeah, I was going to say, Finale, uh, the, the, the Bastion doesn't really go here on Coliseo, so uh, we'll go back over to Tracer, which makes a lot more sense. Yep, something that he's just preferred over the Genji, which has definitely been a point of difference between this Toronto team and some of their contemporaries over the last few weeks. But it's still been pretty effective, especially with Finale's uncanny pulse bomb attachment ability. And we'll have the flankers dueling here on this left-hand side. The Defiant leaning more heavily into this piece of real estate than the area surrounding the bot at the moment. Finale there biting off almost too much. He's able to back away and get topped up. And I think, like, Genji versus Tracer here, right? Like, Genji uh, can obviously go in and finish off those kills rather quickly. Uh, but doesn't have the same level of survivability as a Tracer, right? Being able to recall as Tracer, get the health back, the blinks, just superior movement. The Genji without the dash kind of just stuck. Uh, where I think you see a little bit of a safer pick, and as I say that, it'll be Pelican taking out Finale. <laughs> I'm surprised they, the, the Outlaws don't re realize that Twilight is like one HP and they don't try and dive him there. They let him actually top himself back up with a re regen burst, but either way, they're able to break through the Define eventually. Um, pretty frenetic first fight there. You see a lot of sound, uh, speed boosts being used to try and posture your Zarya threateningly and force the extra bubble out of your opponents. Neither of these, te these teams are playing anything like Sombra, so forcing those Zarya bubbles up is often entirely up to the Zarya themselves in terms of when they want to take the risk of using them for charge. Oh dear, yeah, that's not oh, good. Wow. I, I, this is not good. There. Yeah, I mean, this is terrible. An Amp Matrix here from the Defiant too. Toronto, not really sure what they're hoping to do with that. I mean, it's so easy for the Outlaws just to walk straight on past it. And they're going to get well and truly under the bridge here. And Dante tried to boost himself up over the rock and ended up basically making himself one shot. Got to take it out there by... Hisu coming off spawn, so you lose your tank. I mean, you can actually fight this. Yeah, I think I think Houston give up their chance at a checkpoint there, losing Dante. Yeah. Uh, a little frustrating for them, but still, it doesn't mean that they get back to that position so much quicker. And if they're confident in their neutral fight, which, by the way, they haven't really had to spend any of these ultimates. Uh, Twilight and switched over towards the Ana, crucially, as well. Yeah, which is, like, so bizarre that they constantly oh, go to the Ana's, man. Dude, this has been dominance by the Outlaws, is... They're going to get this bot going the other direction really fast. So many of these picks as well from Merit. Instrumental in battering the Defiant back. 
And again, now with so much of this ground already have been trodden by the outlaws. Oh, the body's much more familiar. Uh, the road more frequently traveled is the faster one. And they're getting back to that checkpoint now with another key pick from Merritt as the overclock finds the mark. Chorong not able to avoid that one. And they're going to run Twilight down, stuck in that corner. The lack of mobility there from Ana definitely hurting. And here's the checkpoint the Outlaws were looking for. Yeah, and you have both supports kind of trapped in that back corner. And now Finale go over to the Bro. Genji here. So just Merritt just cleaning up towards the end. As I don't think you're going to be able to get a ton more progress here if you're Houston, uh, unless you get like an early pickoff from Merritt because you'd think that like the overclock plus sound barrier combination would be so strong being able to take it back. Blade here from Pelican. It's got to be a sound barrier, and here it is. Yeah. Pelican uh, satisfied enough with that result, I think. Hot bar, trying to charge it to the back line, but you can see Dante's done the same, warding Hisu away. But I think you foreshadowed that pretty effectively, Matt, just based on sheer weight of ultimates that are fine are able to stop the outlaws here. Yeah, I mean, once the blade comes out, like, Pelican's not even intending to kill anybody with it, right? It's just forcing out that sound barrier. Uh, what'll be interesting here is how they kind of uh, combat this nano boost. <sighs> Without the blade, maybe it's the nano boost onto Hotbird. It seems like that's kind of been the way that they've been doing it throughout the series. Keeping him alive, oh, pretty important. I guess in some senses it, it mimics the impact of uh, the immortality field on the one target, I suppose. Hopper going to hit much harder now with Dante out of the picture. Who is going to stop him from beaming down his foes? This is very important for the Toronto to fight now as we head to halfway through the round. Getting towards that first checkpoint, very, very important, especially given what they're going to be facing coming back from the Outlaws soon enough. This is more of what we've seen where Toronto's had success, playing stuff like this with really Twilight on the on instead of the map. Is Dante and C crew just trying to figure out where they're going to fight from, right? Like you have this top bridge area, you can kind of contest before the, the bot actually gets underneath, or you can kind of wait a little bit further back. So they use an amp matrix here and the immortality field right away. Healing on Dante, is it enough? Yes, creative out to keep him standing. What a huge turnaround here. The Outlaws now in a decent position to brawl. The grab came in from Hopper though, and it kind of makes that Dude. that much harder. Huge involvement from Twilight's Biter Grenade as well. Yep. Scary stuff. Yeah, as soon as that grab comes in, I was going to be like, oh man, is this going to be enough? Like you have the Batista or the uh, Immortality Field just used a little bit earlier, so didn't have it again. But man, Twilight with another big Biotic Grenade. Is everybody coming back from spawn. Dante will have a grab, and Lasher's going to get close to that beat. So. Probably going to have to give up a little bit of this if you're Toronto, but maybe you come back and fight with Blade and you can get the bot moving yet again. A pretty good progress game from them there. Still in uh, this look, Plenty of wailing and gnashing of teeth for the Outlaws as they play defensively for the last couple of minutes, but the fact is, the Divine don't get that checkpoint. They are still behind by a couple of fights at the very least, and if they get blown out here, the Outlaws are going to be knocking back on their door once more. And hey, what do they spend in this fight? Just the grab. That is a very good sign for the Outlaws who need to obviously weave together a couple winning fights here. Both teams have big ults coming in. Sound barriers, blades, overclocks. And they don't even like necessarily like a need uh, to win these fights, right? You just get this bot so deep into Defiant territory uh, that the trek back for them is so far. You can just keep playing this mid map over and over and over again. Kind of take that same initial fight constantly time after time deplete some ultimates here and you still have uh you know like almost like a 30 meter lead yeah and they're not incentivized to play from that disadvantageous position now because the body's not close to the checkpoint they've already got it and they're past it so they just play here play neutral when merit is just more often than not finding early picks here overclock available means that that prospect becomes a little more likely What's Finale hunting? Okay, no Ajax there for Lastro, but Pelican looks like he didn't get the sound barrier. Biotic Grenade instead, dousing him. Merit only able to find the one kill, but it was on Hotbar, in fairness. So who matches up against Dante? Tough ask here. Chorong and co eventually able to drag him down, but not without a large amount of effort. Yeah, but they'll give the bomb moving in their direction and some ultimates out from the Outlaws, and that's exactly what they needed. So. They have to get Hisu set up in a position to actually make an impact with this overclock. Because, uh, like, shooting uphill, going onto that bridge is going to be tough. Like, you're not going to be able, actually, to get him even up there with you know, him spawning and then having to come all the way back. So, I mean, you're really not going to gain any progress. I mean, what, you're going to have to overclock here to kind of win this fight to move down the hallway. 
if he was alive, you could have got him set up on the high ground, maybe deterred some players coming out of spawn, got even some more barrier progress for the Defiant. Very confused robot at the moment. His master changing very quickly. Here's that overclock from Hisa though. He wants to make something happen here. Headshot on Dante will drop him a little low. Pelican has not gone for the blade quite yet. Waiting for a lot of these ultimates to be done with. Waiting for an opportunity to penetrate to the heart of the setup for Toronto. Twilight, are definitely a juicy morsel for him. him so much healing output from someone like Twilight. Not only because of the hero pick, but also just the player. Patience here from Pelican. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to use it, but you have to cross this much space, right? How about now? Grav here, Hopper caught in that one, trying to go forward with the Nano Immortality Field. Dante, he still can't get away with it. What an important fight win for Toronto. This is absolutely doable now, but the next fight is dry for them. I, I mean, this has been doable for a while now for the Defiant. I mean, what, you're going to get up close here, probably take that checkpoint. Chorong not exactly out of beat yet, so what, maybe Finale can, like, farm up you know, this blade, maybe you get lucky, kind of get like a shot with a railgun out of spawn. Like, this is the spot you want Hisu in, right? Where he's able to kind of like free fire down the hallway. Great bubble, good timing there from Hotbar. But Pelican very quickly pivots to a different choice of target. Very slick, nicely done. Now we'll shut Toronto down now. With not much time left in the round. The Defiant get the checkpoint, yes, but obviously they're hurt by just how long Gluteus Scratchius sits around and waits for his chance to move on. Yes, but another fight for the Defiant and you get the bot going your way. You have a realistic chance, especially if you can hold on to some of these ultimates, right? The blade just came out, so you kind of have like a free beat to use. Uh, and then Vinali here with a blade of his own. Okay, what's nice, the choice of target? Nice Lucio. Blade, yeah. Last throw, no chance to get the sound barrier. That could be a factor in the next fight, though. Houston, good discipline here. Not spending anything as they know that they're, they're getting absolutely tossed aside like ragdolls. Oh my god, Houston Outlaws yep. in final yep. fights. Name a better combo. Uh, and for the Toronto, it was perfect. You couldn't lose any players late. You needed everybody to live. Pelican's gonna go off of Genji and he'll play Tracer here. As look at this, they get Hopper with a Nano. Dante's down, Soundbearer comes out only for four though. This is big, creative. He's just asking for it inside the immortality field. And the bot's so close. Where are the Houston Outlaws? They can't even touch. Merritt tries to get forward here, but he gets blown up in seconds. The Toronto Defiant are so close. Lastro's forced away. Can't do anything about it. And it's defeat plucked from the jaws of victory by the Outlaws. The Toronto Defiant return to perfect symmetry. 12 and 12 as the Outlaws suffer. Another backbreaking loss in this week. They definitely got a lot to work on heading into playoffs. And the biggest thing was Toronto getting that checkpoint before that final fight. You were able to then push up, right? They didn't have to use any real ultimates to be able to get the bot going back in their favor. And then what? You had you know, the ability to sound barrier. You had the ability to nano hotbot, get aggressive, push players back. And that early kill on Adante was huge. Yeah, fiercely contested series from both of these teams. It just feels like the Outlaws they take some uh, pretty brutal psychological damage on Dorado and, and they look so good early on Coliseo. Just starts to fall apart and it feels like the Defiant start to find their rhythm again. It's like a later round switch over towards the Ana, where Hopper has just a little bit of extra support, a little bit of extra backup. Not only obviously is survivability greatly assisted by the Nano, but also means he can punch through uh, that enemies are you just a little bit more. And that pick off on Dante at the start of that last fight changes the entire texture of how this map goes. It, it really does. Uh, and I think that's where you see like the Toronto Defiant peak, right? Where you think that this team can go, right? They beat numerous playoff teams, like teams already guaranteed in the playoffs. Throughout the season, they beat a team that's going, uh, you know, guaranteed spot to the playoffs here today. Uh, it's just, can they get out of play-ins, right? There are some really like wild card, scary teams there in the play-ins. I mean, their first team is the Washington Justice, who could be anything on any who given knows? day. Yeah. You, just, you just don't know what you're walking into there. But this is obviously a huge boost for them. They found a pretty comfortable spot here, and they're even actually able to you know, go away a little bit from the accepted meta compositions and find success there. It's a great sign. It means that they can make these changes on the fly. We want to see an adaptable team, one that can respond to stimulus as the series goes. Let's talk about a player of the match here. Someone who starts off being the centerpiece of this team and, and basically carries the Defiant, even though they lose that first map. Chorong is your player of the match. Moves over towards the Lucio. Serious big-time player here. 
And alongside Hotba and Twilight, of course, making his arm look incredible. Chorong is he's a superstar, man, no doubt about it. Worth every bit of that purported price tag. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, able to come up with some big kills. Uh, you know, at times on the Lucio, I thought when he switched over to the Brig there on Dorado, uh, played really well, you know, trying to keep the Yana alive and they were trying to play those types of comps. And look, I mean, they're, they're playing a comp that a lot of other teams weren't uh, playing or able to play and you know, able to kind of help his support uh, in the back line. So I thought Charong did a really nice job in the Lucio today. Yeah, great stuff and good looks from the Toronto Defiant in general. I think they showed some real guts over the course of this series. I loved what we saw from them on King's Row as well. How they bounce back in this series is, um, you know, I think they've got a lot to be proud of. Oh, you know, jokes aside, obviously, you know, they're even in wins and losses here, but this is not a mid-performance from them at all, actually. I think there's really a lot that they want to ride the, the momentum of heading into the play-ins. And, hey, you know, they take on the winner, I think, of the Boston Uprising and the Florida Mayhem. <laughs> the play-ins are set to be really exciting. Yeah. A lot of teams that have the ability to rise well above their sort of quote-unquote ranking as far as the season's concerned. Huh. Uh, and I think with the way, like, the teams are in play-ins, I almost feel like if you were to replay, like, you know, we'll have play-ins next week, and I, I don't even know where to even begin predicting who would win those games because they're so close. I actually even believe if you were to, like, play that tournament with those four teams, like, three or four times, you probably get, like, a bunch of different results. <laughs> uh, it's that open between these teams where I think uh, Toronto, for them, I think probably just, like, kind of resting up, making sure everybody's feeling good going in next weekend. Uh, because you see the ceiling that they can hit. They can definitely, if you look at the teams in the play-ins, I believe they have like the highest ceiling, maybe with the Justice, uh, which is scary because it's their first matchup, uh, to beat some of those top teams and rise to the occasion. No doubt about it. Looking forward to seeing both of these teams show what they've got in the postseason. Uh, and obviously the Outlaws have plenty to think about now as they have a quick break before yeah. they adjust to a playoffs meta. We're going to, I uh, just want to take a moment to say, uh, I think I speak on behalf of all of your commentary team at the Overwatch League. It's been a pleasure to bring these regular season matches to you. We'll of course see you in play-ins and playoffs, but for now we're headed back to the truck to wrap this match and the day and the regular season up. The Overwatch League is brought to you by Upper Deck, the official trading card of the Overwatch League. And by TeamSpeak, the official voice supplier of the Overwatch League.
<laughs> Welcome to Watchpoint Post Show, everybody. I'm here with Hoppa from Toronto Defiance coming up from a win against Houston Outlaws. Hoppa, congratulations on the win, of course. But before we start, uh, I did see on Twitter that, you know, the Toronto Defiant players are, you know, uh, you guys aren't feeling too well right now. I was just, I wanted to ask you if you guys are feeling better. How is the recovery going? So, 오늘 승리 축하드리면서 일단 질문을 들어가기 전에 제가 토, 어, 트위터에서도 봤는데 이제 팀원들이 지금 좀 코로나 때문에 건강 상태가 안 좋다고 들었어요. 지금 지금 현 상태는 좀 어떤가요? 어 우선 저는 조금 피곤한 거 말고는 괜찮고요. 다른 팀원들은 현재 회복 잘 회복하고 있는 것 같아요. All right, so uh, as for me, I am uh, just just a bit tired, but I'm honestly just fine. Uh, it's everyone else; they are still recovering, uh, but they're trying their best to recover as fast as possible. Uh, yeah, I hope you guys have a fast uh, and speedy recovery uh, for the play-ins next week. Now, for this match, you know, you guys had a bit of a slower start. Uh, you guys uh, did lose the first map, but you guys were able to turn things around. So, how are you able to defeat the Houston Outlaws today? 자, 오늘 경기에 대해서 좀 여쭤보자면은 일단 첫 번째 맵에서 살짝 이렇게 어, 힘들어 하시다가 아무래도 그래도 끝에 가서 승리를 거두시게 되셨는데 오늘 승리 좀 어떻게 해서 어, 얻으신 것 같으신가요? <웃음> 어 우선 그냥 솔직히 이긴 이유는 저희가 더 잘해가지고 당연히 이겼다고 생각하고 아무래도 제가 1세트 지고 나서 무조건 이겨야겠다는 생각에 상대보다 무조건 자탄을 빨리 돌리고 그냥 제가 캐리한 것 같아요 Alright, so... Uh, I think we just, I think we won because to simply put, we were just a better team uh, against the Houston Outlaws. Uh, after we lost map one, we really definitely wanted to win. We needed this win today. So I tried on, I went on that Zarya and tried to get as many grabs as possible. So I was really busy keeping myself busy grabbing that uh, or building that all charge on my Zarya. And yeah, I think I carried. Hoppa, me too. I think you carried. No one else, just you. 제가 봤을 때도 다른 사람들보다 하빠 선수 오늘 캐리를 하지 않았나 싶습니다. <laughs> Alright, uh, and my last question for you, Hoppa, is of course next week you guys are going into the play-ins, going against the Washington Justice. How do you think is how do you think that's going to play out? 자 마지막 질문입니다. 어 다음 주에 플레이인 경기 워싱턴 팀과의 경기가 있습니다. 어떻게 어 되실 것 같으신가요? 좀 쉬울 것 같으신가요? 아무래도 플레이인에 있는 지금 네팀 전부 다 잘하는 팀이라고 생각해서. 좀 저희 건강 상태도 그렇고 아무래도 힘들 것 같긴 한데 결국 꾸역 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 올라갈 것 같아요. 저희가. Alright, so for the play-in, uh, for the play-ins, all four teams that are in the play-in are really, really good teams. So I don't think it's going to be an easy win. When it's going to be a difficult battle for the win because given our current health situations, and everything. But at the end of the day, I think we will squeak. Uh, we will we will be able to get by and climb the ladder and get into the playoffs. All right, Hapa, thank you so much for your time and again, again, congratulations on the win. 자 오늘 승리 축하드리고 다음 주 플레이인에서 뵙도록 하겠습니다, 하빠 선수. 감사합니다. Thank you. 감사합니다. That's right. Sorry, Buck carried the team to victory, and, and Costa was he, right he, all along. He, he wasn't impressed when you said that he carried the game. And because it was yeah. obvious. He was, he was obvious. obvious. Yeah. He was so yeah. obvious. Yeah. yeah, he's like, yeah, no. like, I, don't know, I don't know what impresses Hotba. Yeah. I want to know what Hotba is impressed by. Yeah. He's been in the league for a long time now. I don't know anything. You've not seen him. By. You can you can ask him if he gets to Anaheim. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask Hotba. What right. are you impressed by? We should bring him to the desk. Yeah, going to be uh, between yeah. the ferns or whatever plants we're going to have there. Uh, and you're going to have a sit down with Hoppa. Yeah, yeah. Love that. We're Johnny, uh, a, a uh, right, one -on -one slot interview. it in. Uh, I'm sure Hoppa can't wait for that to happen. <laughs> That's all your plans. For now, though, <laughs> for now, though, let's discuss the game. Uh, Casta. Uh, you are so confident about your Toronto pick. You are, in fact, a genius, or so oh, you claim. I hate this. <laughs> yeah, that's a timeline. But uh, to be fair, I am thrilled to now see the 12th, to, uh, 12th prophecy come true. <laughs> perfectly balanced, as all true. things in life, Toronto Defiant are. They are. They are perfectly in the middle right there. And, you know, they, they played a good game. They've been uh, looking better in this meta, especially with the interesting look of having Twilight go over to that Ana. Sort of gives it a different feel, and it changes the dynamic of how you play in these mirror matchups, because you have that Biotic Nade that really throws a wrench in a lot of strategies. Then you have the Nano Boost, and so you have all these adjustments they have to make, and they played very well around it. And we all know how great of an Ana Twilight is, but 
Houston Outlaws, just not really their weekend. I, you know, I sort of spoke about it. I'm not sure how seriously they were taking these matches as it didn't affect them that much in the grand scheme of things. But I'm sure they're disappointed losing both of these matches nonetheless. You know, this Dorado was pretty brutal from them. They weren't able to get anything going. And then that Coliseo, that was their game to lose. And they unfortunately did lose at the very end. So maybe a couple of, I guess, I don't know, ultimate usage or sort of like the way that they were taking fights against Toronto Fight just a little off. But, you know, it, it won't matter when we get to the playoffs and potentially in the new meta. Rainforest, did you have the uh, impression that Houston Atwells are trying to win this game? Uh, I, I, I mean, yeah, losing sucks. So, uh, yes, I, I do think that Houston Outlaws want to wanted to, uh, to win this game as well. I think, you know, were they as fired up as they would be for like a tournament match? You know, probably not, I, I, I could argue. But, I mean, I don't honestly know the answer to that question. Houston Outlaws, though, I do think that, like, they're one of those teams that, like, you can't, you can't really, like, excuse them too much. Like, at some point, like, we want to see them fulfill their potential. We want to see them be consistent. Like, they got a 16-8 and eight regular season record. That's a great record. That's a great team right there. Houston Outlaws, they've had a successful season, but we keep harping about the tournament results over and over and over again. And I do want to see them come time in Anaheim and stuff like that. Like, you can't lose to the Toronto Fiant. Houston Outlaws, they're supposed to be better than this. But, you know, this was not... The, the, the tournament match that we so very much look forward to. This was the last regular season match against Toronto Defiant with Carico on the horizon. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's uh, take a look at the final standings to see where all our teams ended up at the end of the season. It still feels weird to say the final that standings. we are done. These yeah, are the final, final standings. standings. Love standings. Uh, so here they are. Uh, looking back to like the beginning of the seasons and where you guys saw the teams. Each one of you give me one team which absolutely blew you away in a positive or negative way. I don't care. <laughs> Who wants to take the low hanging fruit? I'll take it. Don't you go for it. <laughs> <laughs> London's fifth player. I think almost yeah. everyone had yeah, them either true. 12th or 13th in their power rankings in the West and they finished sixth with a 14 and 10 record. That, they've been mightily impressive. The way that they've turned their season around has been, has been incredible. I mean, another low hanging fruit. New York Excelsior ending at the way bottom. Yeah. I don't think anyone expected them to be over there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. What about you, Jonathan, middle name Larson? I mean, Paris Eternal went one in 23. That's yeah. pretty disappointing because they were actually like almost 50-50 last year, I believe. Yeah. You know, they had hey, some hey, things yeah. going for them, yeah. But I'm gonna go with the New York Excelsior. You know, this was, we, we came so excited about, you know, Yaki yeah, and Flora so. duo. Uh, we're really looking forward to, to that team and Kellan, for example. Kellan was like one of the most hyped up, like rookie tank yeah. prospects from contenders going into this year. So a bit disappointed to see them end four and 20. That's probably going to result in some changes going into next year and like revamping that roster. How can we, uh, Never mind. I almost said something the bad thing, but <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit disappointing. I would have hoped to see New York uh, slated for maybe a play-in spot or something yeah. like that. Uh, what I do love, though, about the entire season was just that the, the teams kept us guessing, right? Like each and every uh, stage, it was like, oh, who's going to be on top now? Like, we don't know. I, I don't think it was as clear cut as previous years. So it was nice to see the middle of the pack being so close to each other and keep on like fighting for those slots. I mean, heck, we only determined the seedings yesterday, yeah. the second last yeah. day of the playoffs, which uh, playoffs regular season, right. uh, which I think is incredible. So uh, thanks to all the teams for, uh, you know, making it close, making it exciting to watch. Let's take a look at. The, the, what we can expect from play-ins, which start next Ooh. week. Mayhem Uprising, Defiant Justice, honestly, flip a coin or two or three or four. <laughs> I, it, 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 this is so hard to predict. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, honestly, it really comes down to who shows up on the day because I think all of these teams have had high highs and low lows uh, throughout the season. And this is a defined meta and we know what to expect from these teams. But even at that point, I still don't know what's going to happen on these days. Both Florida and Toronto came top four at the Toronto homestand yeah. last, last stage, right? So four of the best teams in the region last stage. Now, both of those are in the play-ins with Washington Justice in the mix with DK. Like, I was about to say, yeah. but DK though, yeah, like, what if DK shows up, right? Anything can happen. <laughs> yeah. True. Uh, it's too true. Uh, no, <laughs> it's just a constant source of frustration because we know they can be so good. Yeah. Uh, but also so bad every once in a while. So uh, I'm, I'm super excited to see which teams show up next week. For now, let's take a look back at what we had today in our best of the day. And we're going to start with uh, you, With Danny. me. Yeah, my best of the day. It's a, it's a pretty simple one. But I think, I mean, 
this player uh, is gonna be sort of my favorite Sojourn player now. He has, he has a Seeker. It used to be proper, but now I, I jumped. Whoa! Uh, <laughs> I like, I have Seeker as my favorite. Uh, he's fueled by anger or sadness of Paris Eternal today, but yes, he had like three, I think it was three really clean shots right there. That was, okay. that was, that was two of them in one. Two, <laughs> two of them were. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, this guy is kind of nuts. Yeah, kind of nuts. Kind of nuts on the Sojourn. Yeah. I like um, the confidence he has too. Yeah. In and out of game, and I think that's what you need if you're a DPS player. Him yeah. versus Hydron on play-ins mm. would be very interesting. Yeah, right. Nice we get to see you. that. Yeah. yeah. Now it's gonna be an awesome matchup. Especially if you see Seeker like like he was against Vancouver Titans, where he was like, <laughs> <laughs> love that. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to. My, I'm think I'm next. Yeah, yeah my yeah, best yeah. of the day. Uh, this happened recently, and it was it was <laughs> two players meeting in the gulag at the final end. You know, usually it's a team game, oh, yeah. but not here. We got the finale versus Pelican one v one to close out the Dorado. Oh. And honestly, finale should have won this by a landslide. I, I think <laughs> with how many blinks and recalls, but you know, Pelican put up a great fight. Wins it with three HP remaining uh, left it left in the tank. So it was it was a, it was a I mean, his fun. name is literally Finale. But Pelican, yeah, Pelican but, had less than 50% yeah. HP, no, before he, when, he, when they started the Yeah, fight. yeah, like yeah. Pelican didn't have a lot of HP yeah. going into that fight, but I thought it was cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's cool. No, did you also <laughs> like it? Was did it cool? Did you think it was cool? Did you like my best yes. of the day as well? well yes, praise I thought my, it was cool. my best of the day. I thought it was a cool best of the day, Costa. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. We rarely have That's those That's so moments. hard to yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> what, 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 what was I going on here? Interested. What was your bad best of the day? <laughs> my bad best of the day? What are these accusations? What, what do you mean bad? Was it, we all had great best of days during the season. Come on, come on, come on. It's the last day. Yeah, going, it yeah. was a great best of day, Scott. Thanks, I really yeah, liked I that. Really it was so exciting. Yeah, it was good. accurate. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. it was fantastic best of day. Uh, uh, my best of day. Yeah. You're all looking at me. <laughs> my best of day. It, it, it was also Seeker, actually. Oh, Seeker, but he wasn't so fragging anyone. Yeah, wow. no, no, uh, but he ended. He, he, you know, he was popping off here, but also, he, besides all the, the rail gunning and, you know, that kind of stuff, he's also emoting, like, at the end of maps, at the end of matches. Like, I just, I just, I think that's cool. <laughs> that's like, you know, there were people running around here. There's people running around on the map, and Seeker's just like, I'm gonna emote right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. He's really the primary this. damage player on the team. He's like, help us kill these guys so we can win the map. Like the there's a tracer! <laughs> On the court, then you're emoting. I don't know. That's just a lot of respect. I love that from from Seeker. Yeah. You know? We we should emote at the end of like things more often. Yeah. You know? I think yeah. I think that's true alpha energy yeah. to drop the mic with an emote. Wouldn't you guys agree? Yeah. Are we gonna yeah. do it? Are we do it? Let's do it. Oh, right. oh, we're emoting. We're emoting. Yeah, that's right. And on that note, we see you again next week. See you next week.